a, a, a place that's like a rehab house. They have three houses. And it was really a fun weekend. I think Saturday night I went to bed at 3.30 in the morning. We were praying for people till one and they didn't want to go to bed and there was still a circle of folks. It was just fun. And then we had afternoon service. I think we got back, we got over going on seven. It was just fun. We had a good time. So they didn't have any time restraints, so I fit in there real good. I was like, yes, Jesus, you love me so much. He took me where they just didn't even look at the clock. So I was pretty pumped. But uh, I was surrounded by hepatitis and STDs. and The gospel really loves to love on people. Yeah, it sure does. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He loves to restore folks that lost their value in life. We're going to do, receive communion this morning. Do communion. What a terrible phrase. We're going to receive communion. And uh, thank you, God. Somebody just, oh, bless you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Where's your honey? Is he getting this? Is he? Right now, like this morning? Oh, it's over? Okay. Oh, just bless him, Jesus. Thank you. Bless him, Lord. Yeah. God's your grace in him. Thank you. Amen. Uh, it was just requested when I do communion this morning, someone asked me if I would just cover something in Corinthians. If you want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we'll do that. It's, it's fine. Thank you, Father. What we're about to do, receiving communion, is, is not, it's not a tradition, it's not an ordinance, it's, it's remembering Him. Amen? When you receive communion, you're remembering him and what he accomplished and what he did. Remembering his death. And, and it's really an important thing. I know we talked about this early in the school and I said about how I receive communion every day in a season in my life. And it just got really, really big in me. And in fact, Holy Spirit just kept putting scripture after scripture together. And, and, and I, would, I would literally take the bread and I would begin to thank him for the body and I would connect the correlation and the relationship of his body to what I've received and what he's done and what he intended and all that. And, and it would be like 40 minutes into it. And I still didn't take this. And I, and I was remembering. <laughs> I was like, and, it, and it got kind of a paradox because I couldn't get up and go to the office. I had to get up really early to receive communion <laughs> because 40 minutes I didn't take the, the bread. And then we had to get to the blood and I'm like, oh dear Jesus. <laughs> and, and to me it's just that exciting. See, it's, it's just okay to, to give yourself to that level to this gospel and, and shake yourself from becoming familiar with the message. Because it's not a message, it's a relationship. It's, you're not serving a doctrine. You're not following a principle. You're in relationship with Almighty God. And that's what I didn't know and realize my whole life. And that's, that's my problem now. See, I'm, just, I'm in love. I really am. Jesus is amazing. He's real. He's alive. I mean, I, I felt His love for these people this weekend so much. I mean, you get near Him and you just, you see their life. You, 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 can I be real straight with you? You, you, you literally see what they're thinking. And, and you don't have to boast that and proclaim that. It just helps you talk to them and minister to them. And they're like, wow. You know, people say, it's like you're inside my head. <laughs> More than you know. It's because Jesus loves people. And when your heart's sincere... And the reason you're ministering is for them. Because you already know who you are. You're not trying to feel spiritual. You don't need a ministry rush. You already know who you are. You're not doing it for you. You're, for them, it's amazing what he'll show you. One dear little girl walked up to me yesterday. It was so funny. She said, can you just pray for me? I said, it's really important that you ask me. What you want me to pray for? There's something about you expressing your heart. Uh, just pray for me. I said, honey, 
I really want you to talk to me. It's important. There's something important about you opening up your heart to me. I looked right in the eyeballs and I said, I already see more than you know, so it's okay. And she went, <laughs> and then I shared like one little line. And she said, oh, and she just, because <laughs> she realized <laughs> that I already saw. But it was something about her, because she was living real closed. And God just wanted her to be okay and open up. It was just fun. I don't know about you, but I like that kind of stuff. It was just sweet. So we had a fun weekend. It's not a doctrine. We're not just following a principle. I don't know why I feel so impressed to share that in the school right now and say it again. It's a relationship with the Lord God Almighty. We're called into fellowship through His Son. It's time to talk intimate with Him and be personal with Him. When you receive communion, what a time to get face to face. And not put on a spiritual face, but just be real with God. Lord Jesus, You really did this. You really came and were beat beyond description. You literally took nails through your hands and shed your blood so that I could be clean. It was that important to you that I would be washed and clean and back in the family and back in this race and fulfilling destiny. Lord, you're amazing. Christians don't pray like that. I've, I've found that out over the years. Because <laughs> I ask people and we just kind of, you know, we get religious sometimes. We don't even realize it. But I mean being real with God and, 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 and going after this thing to where Holy Spirit can touch your heart and make it alive. Where you actually, actually are excited about it. That's a grace thing. It's not your job to just uh, pump yourself up. It's your place to live by faith. And as you live by faith, grace will quicken your heart. As you stay in this race, as you stay consistent, grace will make you alive on the inside. It's not your place to be okay. It's your place to believe. Are you following me? Yeah, that's, yes, that's really good. Oh man, I feel fun this morning. I just feel happy. I didn't hardly get no sleep all weekend. I'm like, I do. I feel half drunk right now. It's ridiculous. I feel like I was on some kind of weekend binge or something. I'm like, help me, Jesus. But I feel so alive inside. <laughs> Saw a bunch of people healed. Oh my goodness. You see this guy, he's like, oh, oh. Uh, he doesn't know what's wrong. He's like, gets, oh. And he's like, huh? It's just fun. This young boy was there. He said, he said, uh, I never come to these meetings. And I don't know why, but I just kept saying to my sister, we need to go. We need to go. She said, it's crazy. I tried to get him to come, and he never comes. Now I, I'm not in a position to go. And he says, we got to go. She said, I was so mad at him. <laughs> Isn't it funny? She wants him to go all the time and he never wants to go and she's mad at him and now she's not prepared to go and he said, I want to go and she's mad again. <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, what's up with us? <laughs> no, love says, drop what you're doing and take him, you know? It's like, you want a what? Fine. He has a herniated disc. He's, he's got something in his stomach that it has this sensation all the time. It's something. And he comes and he sees stuff going on and he's just kind of looking and we prayed for him and I got somebody, might have been a sister to touch him, I don't remember. I get people involved. Because the last thing you want is them to think it's you. It's Jesus. He lives in us. And uh, he couldn't bend. This, he's so young. I said, you're so young. What'd you do to your back, man? He said, I don't even know. But they said, it's herniated and stuff. <laughs> he goes down, he touches the floor. He's touching his toes. He comes up and he goes, and he's just quiet. I said, you okay? You're not hurting, are you? Oh, no. Check it in. And he's like real subdued. You, you know, he's not excited. He's not like, wow. People have so many different reactions. We've got to talk about that today too, even just because on the streets. But here he was taken back because he said, I never thought this was real. I just figured it was people making it up, people exaggerating people's emotions. He said, I don't have any pain. I said, what about your stomach? He went, Oh my God. He was just undone. He's there on Sunday for service. It was just fun. It's just fun. Jesus is revealing himself. And it's because of this right here. Because he really came, guys. 
He really did what we talk about. <laughs> he did what we talk about. It's really alive. Let's read this. Verse 27. You have to understand in the... In the, in the now we'll back up. That's, uh, I want you to understand the context of this scripture. Uh, in verse 17. He's addressing the Corinthians. They were not doing well with the communion elements. <laughs> they just weren't. <laughs> They were coming and eating the bread for lunch, I guess, <laughs> and drinking the wine to feel happy. I don't know. We'll see. Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better, but for the worst. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there's divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Oh, that's an interesting phrase. Isn't it? He's addressing divisions. The Bible calls us to unity, doesn't it? Isn't it amazing how divisions always try to rise up, especially when God's in the middle of moving, like in a special way? Isn't it amazing how divisions try to rise up? We're called the unity. It seems like we're in a war, doesn't it? Seems like we ought to probably co-labor with truth and run with Jesus, huh? <laughs> Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, and the works of the devil are sin. That's selfishness. Sin is selfishness. You know, if, if, you, if you want to summarize sin, the Bible in the New Testament defines sin two places in the New Testament. It says anything that's not of faith is sin. Wow. It's probably because then we're living by the flesh. It's probably, wow, that's not hard to understand, is it? That's why I'm real big about not ministering to people's feelings. But ministering truth to their heart. I don't want to teach people to, to not live by faith. Because anything not of faith is sin. And it's impossible to please God without faith. So who cares how I feel? It matters what he says. Are you following me? You can't find me one place where it tells you it's healthy to live by your emotions. Your emotions can be so whacked and so out of line. But just because you're feeling those emotions, you can still say, this person here has an amazing thing they, quote, they said. I was listening to Dan speak about Matthew 17. It came to mind at times when I saw the most significant healings when I prayed for people. I didn't feel particularly prepared. Well, sometimes when people don't feel particularly prepared, what do they do? Step back and don't bother praying. So this, this person that wrote this in, Mandy, it, it's neat what she did. She said, or I wasn't particularly prepared or on a spiritual high. Well, yeah, I don't encourage you to learn, to, to feel, to learn to, that you have to ride some wave into the move of God. You, 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 you live in Christ. You're not, you're not trying to get pumped up to minister. That's like a zero to me because then you're trying to ride a wave and if that wave doesn't seem there, you'll back off. She didn't back off. So this is good what she wrote here. I probably was a bit anxious. She's being honest. But see, that's not a problem. You, you just got to get a hold of it. You feel a bit anxious. You feel a bit unprepared. You feel a bit whatever. Focused on self. A little self-conscious. Like, oh my God. Who's, who's ever went to pray for somebody and you heard voices immediately speak that you weren't in a position to move this way and that God wasn't going to move and that you weren't in a line and stuff like that? Man, that comes immediately. Why? Because he wants to get inside your head and, and, and shut everything down. He's afraid of the kingdom. Still there. The kingdom's still there. Watch, he's a bit anxious. And, and, and when the opportunities unexpectedly arose. But before praying, she said, I took a minute to settle myself and told doubt and worry to get out and reaffirmed how Christ has moved through me in the past. So, so it's, that's a big deal. So I commend you, Mandy. Yeah, that's a beautiful principle. And thanks for sharing it. Because she's an online student. So because the biggest thing you do when you don't feel prepared or when you're not on a spiritual high is to back up and not step out because you're not prepared. Well, you're prepared by faith. You're prepared through believing what he's already accomplished. It's not your prayer that heals anybody anyway. It's what you believe about what he accomplished in his love for the person. 
And see, that's what we're growing past. That's what we're getting past. Because we got all this war going on when we pray. Self-consciousness just <clears throat> tries to run us over like a freight train sometimes. And what you're saying and what you're doing and just that sensual realm. And I commend her, commend her for this because this is good. What she did was she went, you know what, it doesn't matter how I feel. That's what I'm hearing here. Look, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in denial. I'm, I'm realizing I feel these things, but what does that matter Who I am in Christ, how God has moved through me before. It's not about me being prepared or even thinking these things. It's not about me being on a spiritual high. It's about Jesus being Lord. Ah, yeah, I can do this because He said do this. And all of a sudden you get a grip on faith. Or you're just a great minister. I don't think so. He's a great Jesus. He's a great Lord. And we just follow him. It's so good. Now, I understand you study, show yourself approved, buffet yourself, give yourself. I understand all that. But if it wasn't for grace, if it wasn't for mercy, we wouldn't be in the position we're in. That's what I'm saying. You follow me? So you have to put it all back to him. So this is what she did. And she said, I, I wondered if this be something that would be uh, advised as helpful. I don't know. But taking some time and getting yourself. That's what I would always encourage. Uh, honestly, if I'd ask you to raise your hand and you've prayed for the sick, you, you can relate and you've been through these feelings. Rather than back off, get a grip on truth and live by faith. Amen? Okay. Therefore, when I come, when you come together in one place, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? <laughs> for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of the others. One is hungry and another is drunk. So... That's why Paul's writing pretty sober here. Verse 17, 18, 19. He's talking pretty sober. He's saying, what? <laughs> Don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you in this. <laughs> so do you see how it's okay to correct people? It's okay to talk straight, but your heart has to be in love. You're not writing because you're frustrated. You're writing for their sake because you don't want them to keep living like this and miss the blessing of the truth. Amen? There's times you have to address your kids. There's times you have to talk to people, especially pastoring and stuff. You have to really talk to people. You have to correct things and adjust things. I've found that a lot of folks have been touched so wrong in their life that if you start correcting them, they already like... <laughs> they, they do a lot of things <laughs> get defensive put a wall up shut down all kinds of stuff feel hurt devastated oh God now even you're correcting me you have to make sure it's in love or you'll do a lot of harm but correcting is important but do you see how plain he's talking here he just went right to the core of it didn't he there's a couple places in the Corinthian church that he addressed pretty heavy <laughs> he's like what yeah <laughs> uh, so he says, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? No. For I, now he's sharing the beauty of communion. And he's saying, guys, you're taking this thing lightly. You're misusing, misunderstanding. You're creating divisions. And then watch this. When you do do this, if you do this, you might just be reducing it to religious practice. Because where are your hearts in the midst of all this? What are you guys doing? Where's your hearts? And that's a good thing to ask yourself. All that, Man, where's my heart in this? Where's the why behind my life? What am I doing right now? Shake yourself and get yourself in faith. See what I mean? Keep your heart alive. So here's what he says. I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. I love this. He received this from the Lord. He didn't say he read one of the Gospels. Isn't this cool that he received this from Jesus himself? He didn't read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John and the account of the Last Supper, but he describes it beautifully. Isn't that rich to you? Uh, to me, that's rich. That means Jesus will speak to you that clear. He received from the Lord. You can, go, you can go to the Gospels and find the same exact account. Isn't that beautiful? I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night which he was betrayed took bread. Isn't that neat that you can be in fellowship with Jesus and he can come and tell you how it was and tell you what he did and reveal himself to you? I was, I was in a hotel one night. I've told this story. I don't know if I told it in this store, or school, but I won't be long with it. But the Holy Spirit woke me up at 5 in the morning. Todd and I went to bed at 2. 
Holy Spirit woke me up at five. I woke up. I'm wide. I was like, and he said, hey, yeah. He said, let's go run together. I got so giddy. My heart was, I was like sweaty palmed. I was like, run together? I'm like, it's five in the morning. You want to run with me? I was like, can I have this dance kind of thing? I'm like, I get up. I'm like, I'll run with you. I put on my clothes. Todd's laying there. He is snoring. He is out, man. This, this guy is going. And I'm thinking, he's just snoring anyway. I guess, you know, you can't sleep, Lord, or something. You know, he never slumbers. It was a joke. But we took off. We took off and ran. And I'm running on this dark road at five in the morning on three hours sleep. And when I run, I run at least five miles. So I'm running, and the whole time I'm running, whoo, emotional. He's just talking to me like we talk. And he's teaching me about the blood and the power of the cross and redemption and righteousness. And I'm running down this dark, totally dark black country road, no lights, nowhere, a farm every mile and a half. The day before I ran down that road and almost got eaten by a dog, I had to command him in Jesus' name. <laughs> Serious, you have no idea. I had three one day. That's the thing about traveling and jogging down these farm roads. The dogs try to eat you everywhere you go. I had three of them surrounding me one day and their teeth were like that long. <laughs> and they were doing the wolf thing, man. They, were, they had a strategy to kill me. And I stopped and I looked and I said, you will not bite me in the authority of Jesus' name. You back off, you stay right now. And I stayed, I kept my, my back, I just stayed. And I wasn't that I was afraid to believe, I just was taking authority. <laughs> and they were like, we really want to bite you. I said, you ain't biting me, you stay. And I backed off and did that, man, I was like, thank you, Jesus. Because if it wasn't for the gospel, I'd have been freaked out, afraid, tried to run faster, they'd have drug me down and killed me. <laughs> You'd have read about me in the paper. Man mauled by two Rottweilers and a pit bull. Because that's what it was. And they were like... Argh. And... Uh, but, but the day before, this dog almost kills me on this road. He comes running up. and I mean, he looked like he was going to bite me in the thigh. He just got that close. And I'm like, whoa, dear Jesus. So here I am now running by the same place in the pit stark. And I'm not even thinking about the dog till I get back to the hotel. And I'm like, oh my goodness, God, you're amazing. But I'm running down this dark country road. Oh, if you'd have been out doing something early in the morning, you'd have thought, who is that crazy guy? I'm running down the road. I'm laughing. I'm yelling. I'm going, yes, that's amazing. Oh, God. And I'm running so fast. I do five miles. I get back. It's under a half hour on three hours sleep. So it was under six minute miles. And I'm back at the hotel and I'm like, oh my God. And I didn't know what to do. I was undone because I'm having communion with the Lord. And, and it so gave my heart revelation and excitement. And I'm like, <laughs> so uh, there's Todd. He, didn't, he, he hasn't even moved. He's getting revelation himself. <laughs> He's just, <laughs> and, and, I mean, he was deep in the sleep of the Lord. <laughs> and, uh, it was, wasn't real sweet, but it says it's sweet. The Bible says your sleep is sweet. <laughs> it wasn't sweet to the onlooker. <laughs> That's so funny. It just, so, so we had so much fun with this. I get a shower. I'm laying in bed. And, and I got a shower real, as quiet as I could. I had to run a water and stuff. But I'm being quiet. I'm trying to be gracious. And I slide in bed. And he always tells me when to get him up. Because he knows that I'm always up. So I just get him up. And he's like, uh, you want to get in the shower first? Or you want me? And I said, man, I'm already showered. And he popped his head up. What? I told him me and Holy Spirit went for a run. You were laying here snoring. So we just laughed and went for a run. He said, what? You left me? You and Holy Spirit left me here all alone. I said, we really did. <laughs> and all was so funny. But I was so alive. You know what I'm saying? And it was from communion, just fellowship. Now, I didn't initiate that. He just asked me to go run. It was an honor. I didn't care if it was five in the morning. If he wants to go run, I'm running. Because he's going to make me okay. You would have thought I slept more than enough. Sharper than ever. And I thought, man, fellowship with Jesus is what we're called to. It's just awesome. Now, who knows that on the day I'm running, and I didn't have that impression, I can invite him into my run. I can talk to him while I'm running. I can thank him for loving me. See, that's what I do a lot when I run. And I have some of my most amazing communion and conversations with God when I'm jogging. It's just awesome. 
He'll just interrupt me sometime out of the blue. I'll be running and he'll just speak to me and tell me something cool. Well, I'm running. It's how I get through my miles. <laughs> so it's just neat. So here's this is Paul. So when I see this, I get excited because this is available for every one of us, guys. Like, it's, it's really available. Okay, these two guys got married a little while back. If, if they didn't begin to talk to one another and get to know one another at some level, they would certainly never have what they have right now. It's just, this is simple. This isn't rocket science. This is... So you begin to commune. You share heart. You go deeper. You find out who each other are. You find out... All of a sudden, there's a connectivity, and next thing you know, there's a covenant. You follow what I mean? Now, God's made the covenant, but we have to enter in and grow in fellowship with Him. Communion is a beautiful way. Watch what He does. He says, on the same night... That, that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take and eat, for this is my body, that's what we're going to do here in a moment, which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup, saying, watch this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Oh my goodness, that means Righteousness. That means standing right before God without any sense of guilt or shame or condemnation or sin. It's the covenant in blood. His blood's in the mercy seat. He's sitting there affirming covenant. It's amazing. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You know, it would do some people good. Some Christians, it would really do good. I'm not being facetious and pointing out people specifically or thinking of anybody in my mind. I just know over time it'd be good for some Christians to crack the lid of one of these all the time and say God I'm so clean God you see me so purely God you've made me so lovely in your sight God you've washed me and made me completely pure because the more you believe that the more you'll see yourself through Christ and the more you'll see others through Christ the more you'll live by the Spirit because if you're still fighting and struggling with yourself and trying to change yourself and disappointed with yourself and I ought to know better by now I've been in this school how come I'm still the and now you're just frustrated. And your knowledge is working against you. And love's not edifying. You follow me? It'd be really important to crack this thing often. Father, when you see me, you smile. I don't know if Christians talk like that. That's right. I think we think God's like, <laughs> He's not. While we were yet sinners, He sent His Son. And you look at me, you smile. It was your good pleasure to give me the kingdom. Your good pleasure. It made you feel good to give me the kingdom. It wasn't a, a faith risk and you weren't like, Oh God, here we go. Let's see how this flies. <laughs> it was your good pleasure to give me the kingdom. It pleased you to bruise your son. Isaiah 53. It pleased you to bruise your son and cause his soul to grieve. Isaiah 53, 10 when you made him an offering for sin so you could reach me so you could get to me because you value me because you know that you created me for your glory and I never knew that I was trying to find my own glory God I surrender that so I can walk in you clearly and plainly thank you for loving me you get the concept of this? it will bring you right into relationship are you following me? Or you can just let your heart believe a whole lot of other things and not walk by faith. <laughs> you can let life be your barometer and you have a lot of other options. <laughs> they just don't produce life. <laughs> and you can beat up yourself and you can try harder. <laughs> it's not about trying harder, it's about believing. Amen? I'm just... I hope you guys are all right. Y'all are just staring at me. Did you have an okay weekend? Are you guys all right? Did I have too good of a weekend? What's going on here? You guys are like... You ought to see it from my vantage point. If it, 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 you know, if I was like Jeremiah, if I'm looking at the faces of men right now... <laughs> you guys all right? You good? Okay. Here's how you can comprehend that. 
He made you with such an awesome potential, Donna. He made you so wonderfully and so precious and so incredible and you've just never realized the magnitude of it to the tune of the death of Jesus so Donna can live. <clears throat> that it would please him to kill Jesus on a cross so he could raise you from the dead. Right. Duh! It's too good to be true, it seems, doesn't it? It's called the gospel. It's good news. <laughs> And you just ain't heard good news your whole life. <laughs> it's awesome, girl. It pleased him because he knew you before you were known. And he says, Donna's life is so worth living. I want her to write legacy. I want her in my arms. I want her in my home. I made her for me and for my pleasure to father her. Ah, I'll give my son to obtain her. I found a pearl of great price. I'm going to sell everything to obtain her. Ah. And when I get her, I'm just going to shine her up and showcase her and just wear her boldly. <laughs> you ought to think that way. It'll make, don't be afraid you'll act like me, but it'll make you like me. <laughs> okay? Oh my goodness, I feel this is one of these goosebumpy moments. <laughs> that was good comments. That was her heart cry. That was. When you go to Andrew Womack's ministry, we're just in Colorado, it says the almost too good to be true gospel. Yeah. I heard Graham Cook say that when the gospel's preached clearly, it hinges and borders on fairy tale. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh. So, if Jesus is the truth, then he's the truth about us. If he said all this and did all this for us, so that we might be in him. So is life worth living? Yeah. Yay. If we were truly to be seeing our eyes be God eyes in us, if we saw from his perspective, every time we looked at somebody, we would see their potential instead of where they are. Bingo. Exactly. Totally. So, Miss Donna, I know you're heading out right now, but... Yeah, I know. It's a tissue moment. I understand. <laughs> but the, the greatest thing you can do, dear, is when nobody's looking, it's just you, you man, you just... You really were pleased to bruise Jesus, to make my life complete and whole, and mend me and heal me. God, everything that was ever said to me, everything that was done contrary to truth, is rendered powerless now. See, we, we let those things still have a voice because we don't address truth with faith. Watch, all those things are rendered powerless now. The truth about me is out. It's in the light. It's you love me. I'm amazing to you. My potential is worth the death of Jesus. My life lived is worth you putting your son on the cross. Oh my goodness, illuminate my eyes and continue to show me. I'm ready to co-labor with you. I'm in, God. Thank you for fearfully, wonderfully making me. As you do that, grace will illuminate your heart. You'll see the value of your life. You follow me? Like, it does wig some people out sometimes when I talk to people. Like, I say, man, he smiles towards me. He loves me. He's, we don't have that picture of God. Even though we hear that kind of teaching, we still don't personally have that picture of God for ourselves if we're not careful. But I do, and I talk plainly about it. And some people are like, yeah. It's called living by grace, man. I'm not on eggshells. Do you understand that? I'm not waking up wondering how I might miss God today. And I'm not waking up trying to please Him. He's pleased that I wake up. He's glad I'm alive. Because He loves me. Do you follow how simple that is? How you doing, kiddo? <laughs> it's always good to see you. It really is. We're going to get to this. We really are going to get to this. Are you guys okay with what we're going, where we're at right now? You getting something out of this? Good. Because I never know why we're where we're at. I'm just kind of here. The cup. The bread, the cup, in the same manner. Now look at verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. Now I want you to see this. It's dual. It's, it's a covenant. It's, it's the bread and the cup. It's not just the forgiveness of sin. It's the body too. It's the bread. You get it? And we're heading somewhere with this. So, okay. 
What this cup represents is an act that took place to forgive every sin I committed. It's called the blood of Jesus, right? For the remission of your sin, the blood. This body was given because sin cost a price and there's effects of sin. It's called the fall of man. And sin has bit us in many ways and affected our bodies, our souls. Think of the crown of thorns pushed down onto his head. You ever see little retakes in movies of Jesus? And they push that thing down, the big long dagger thorns, and it was probably that nasty. It's this symbolic stuff. There's an allegories, analogies. There's stuff, you know, he's, he's, blood's just pouring out. He's, you know, thorns representing a curse and all this. It's pushed down over his head. And now we get a helmet of salvation. Come on. Oh. <gasps> He'll just take time and look this stuff up, man, and just check it out. Just not be in a hurry. <laughs> Crushed down. Ah. Now we get a helmet of salvation. We get a sound mind. You follow me? It pleased him to do that. He knew it was coming, guys. Didn't he? Oh, he knew it was coming. He said, bring it on because now they'll see clear. Grace will be on the earth for them to understand. Illumination will come. Bring it on. Yeah. I preached one time. It really, it really was intense out of Isaiah and how you might be amazed how God pulled back and let darkness have its way, but at the same time was somehow... It just came out. Of, I was at a healing service. Oh, my gosh. It was, I never preached it after that. I never preached it before that. But how God was behind the scenes. And it pleased him to bruise his son where he was literally hit him again. Hit him again. I got real dramatic and real. Hit him again. Because with every blow, he knew children were being set free. With every blow. Because he knew he was going to raise him from the dead. He knew he was going to defeat death and hell and the grave. He knew in three days he's going to raise him from the dead. Ah, and he was like, hit him again because with every blow, with every suffering, his people could go free. It was intense. It came out. I'm not going to try to re-preach it, but there was a concept there that was deep. Therefore, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Well, you know why he just said that? Don't be afraid of that comment. He's saying that because he's addressing some flagrance. He's addressing that they were missing the reverence of what they were even doing. They were coming to eat and some were even getting drunk. But, but regardless, you can do the same thing by just getting traditional and going through the motions. True? You might not be drinking wine to get drunk. But you could do it just because it's what we do in church and disregard the power of what you're doing and not release faith and not be sincere. True? Who knows you can do anything and not be sincere? So we do need to grab this because God seemed to think this corrective letter was fit to be written in His Word. Did you ever think about that stuff? Like... Jesus, if things that he did were written one by one, the world wouldn't contain the books. However, this stuff was written. That makes this stuff that's written extremely important to me. If the things that could have been written one by one, the world wouldn't have contained the books, and yet God narrowed it down to what we have, then what we have must be fitting. And it must be enough. Isn't that cool? There was an African man I read about. And, and it was back some, some years ago. So I don't, I don't know details, but I read this article about this man and these missionaries found this man and he's almost like a mystery man and God walked with this man and, and I don't even think he's alive today. It was years ago. But he, he found a page of the book of Acts. It was a piece. I think it was Acts 8. It was, but to him, yeah, it was Acts 8 and Philip and the chariot and the eunuch and and Jesus, and baptism, and, and then Philip was translated. He, had this, he found a page of Acts 8 and came to the knowledge of Christ. 
and didn't have nothing else, no, no Bible. He just had a page of Acts 8. And when these missionaries were in this serious part of Africa with these 9,000 foot mountains and stuff and, and rugged, rough country, it was an area where it was really mountainy. They were going into these villages that were very primitive and that they'd never heard of Christ, so they figured, and they go in there and these villages were saved. And they're all serving Jesus. And these people, these missionaries are like, how do you guys know about Jesus? It's so and so, and he had a name. There was a name in this article. It's been 15 years since I read the article, but it so fascinated me. The innocence of this man. Because, you know, sometimes we're just, God, God restores the innocence. This guy, they met up with him finally, and they said, How? You're so and so. You're the reason all these villages. How are you walking, getting to? It would take us forever to get to all these villages. How have you gotten to all these villages? Because they, they had some different setup. I think they had other transportation from mountains to mountains. This guy's just on foot wearing some little goat skin. Serious. He's just wearing like a little ephod. Probably dancing like David danced. <laughs> Turn off your prophetic gifting and just rejoice. <laughs> what? He would walk into these villages and begin to s proclaim Jesus and the, the sky would clap and thunder and God with an audible voice would speak. And the village would shake, fall on its face and get saved. Guess how he got to the villages? He just showed up there. And they said, how do you get to all these? He said, what, what do you mean? You know, he's talking in however he's talking. I don't, I'm confused. What do you mean, how do you get there? He said, God, just take me there. Isn't that how Christians do it? Because he read Acts 8. And he goes, oh, this is how Christians travel. God, I'm, what? can you imagine him in a mountain? God, I'm willing, salvation comes on him. He says, God, I'm willing to go preach your gospel. I'm willing to be like Philip. I'm willing to go into any village you want me to. God, thank you. Boop, and he's there. And now he, that's all he, that's the way to him. Help us, Jesus. <laughs> we could probably stop and put our hands on our heads and say, help us now. I've been taught and I talk about it all the time, but usually it's just when we're sitting in traffic and we're like, dude, we need to get more spiritual and translate. <laughs> or you're paying for airfare and you're like. <laughs> but he looked at him very, and the thing they were really going wild about is the innocence. And he's like, well, this is how Brother Philip did it. I figured this is how Christians travel. Well, it's sure redemptive. Boom, 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 boom. Man, you hit like six villages in a day. <laughs> It'd take you six days to just get over the mountains, you know. Oh, my goodness. So just fun, innocence. I don't even know how I got into that story. We're not going to do this in an unworthy manner. Let a man examine himself. And so let him eat the bread and drink the cup. Now I know a lot of people, when he says let a man examine himself, of course you don't want to just live with sins in your heart that you're aware of and things like that. No, we should be walking in relationship and repentance and stuff. This is not a heavy verse. What it's saying is, check in with your heart. Be sincere. Why are you doing this? Where are you at when you're doing this? Because the worst thing you want to do is teach yourself religion and tradition. It doesn't mean write, write down all the sins you committed in the last month or anything. It means check in with your heart. Live with a pure heart. God, my heart is so for you. God, thank you for swallowing up every weakness. God, I'm doing this with all my being, all my heart. Thank you for your love for me. There's a place to just check in. You know your heart. You know what that takes. For me, it's just become simple. I, I can look inside my heart in, in a moment. So can you if, you, if you'd be sincere. You can look in your heart and know what makes you tick in a moment. Right? So you're just going to take these and go, okay, wow. It's just like Mandy said when she's praying for the sick. Yeah, a little bit anxious, don't feel really prepared. What does that matter? Jesus loves this person. He's Lord and he lives in me. It's all grace. God, thank you. I just doubt and worry you have no voice in my life. Jesus, you've moved through me. You continue to move through me. You love people. 
That's really what that means. Examine yourself. That, you just take an inventory. You're looking inside. Now watch this. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner. You fail to be reverent. You fail to take to heart. You fail to take serious. Eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now there's two, there's two teachings on this out there. I think they both have credential and, and because if you realize in the beginning there's division, they're abusing the elements and some are eating up the bread. Can you imagine then Sister Sally, she so loves the Lord, she's so into communion, she goes and the bread's not even hardly there and they can't even pass it out because Joe's over there with a... <laughs> Forgive me, Joe, not Joe March. It wasn't Joe March. I wasn't talking about your dad. But Joe, I just made up a name. Joe's sitting over there, and Freddie's sitting over in the corner, hiccuping, and she can't even find the wine. So who knows that she could react to that, take it serious. She loves the Lord. She's like, you guys, now we can't even take communion. You know, what are you doing? There's division. There's factions. There's things going on. Oh, chill, sister, Jesus loves us. You know? <laughs> Can you imagine all the craziness that could go on there? Now watch this. So the Lord's body, there's a reverence we ought to have for God, for Jesus, for what he accomplished. There's also, we ought to have it for one another. We ought to consider others more highly than ourselves. We ought to recognize the beauty of who we are in him. We ought to discern that. So I agree with both teachings. But where I lean, personally, this is just personal. Not discerning the Lord's body is we're so big on the forgiveness of sins. And we tend to get confused on healing and don't regard the body as much as we regard the blood. And that's what that means to me personally. So as a teacher and a preacher, what I preach is, mostly is, we better be sure that it's a dual covenant. What's easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? To show you I have the power to forgive sin, rise and walk. What made that happen? What's the forgiveness of sins? What's the healing of your flesh? John 6, you eat of the flesh and drink of the blood. For if you fail to eat of the flesh and drink of the blood, you can't have life. Some of us focus on the blood and fail to discern the body. We're big on pray this prayer to get to heaven. Jesus died for the mission of your sin. But why did he get beat beyond description? Now watch. Watch the significance. And you have to hear this clear. Don't you hear this in a heavy ear? Not discerning the Lord's body for this reason. Many, not everybody. But for this reason, many are weak. Sick among you and many sleep. It means died early. Now that's in your Bible. For one reason, possibly failing to discern the body. Isn't it amazing that he didn't make it complex and, 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 and say that he, he said, for this reason, many. So that gets my attention. I want to honor and recognize and keep in front of my heart what he accomplished. And I don't want to just drink the blood. I want to eat the bread. You follow? Now watch this. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. So that goes back to verse 28. Examine yourself. <clears throat> when we are judged, we are chastised by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. You see what he's addressing here? They were coming for the wrong reason and doing this for the wrong reason. When you back up to verse 32, we are chastised by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. There, there is a place where, man, this one's hard to teach because God doesn't, God doesn't minister sickness. It's not like in his bag of tricks, okay? If you start believing God ministers sickness, then he subcontracts the devil, and then he put Jesus on the cross to take away the same thing he's going to use as a tool. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. But there's a place where God sits back and looks for faith and waits for faith. There's a place where you reap what you sow, 
And mercy's still there, and, and it's all that good stuff. But if God would just always intervene where there's no faith, what would he be doing? Enabling you to live outside of him or in the flesh or whatever. Love is so strong. Love is so mature and so powerful. We don't understand love. Like, we will enable somebody we say we love before we stand and watch them fall and know there's... Oh, and then help them up or patch them up. But we'll try to keep them from the fall when that whole process brings them to clarity, understanding, and transformation, hopefully, because if it doesn't, then what are we accomplishing? Love is a lot deeper than we understand. So when God's sitting there, could he just prevent everything? Well, there's, he's God. But isn't it amazing how men still reap what they sow? So you're not discerning, you're doing something traditional, you're doing something religious, you do, boom, now something's coming on your life and God's just there waiting, lining up, giving you probably words that you don't even realize, people saying things, sometimes our mind's spinning, getting wrong counsel, believing all the wrong stuff, not even reading the Bible, just why is this happening to me, here we go again, da da da. And there's God wanting to appropriate this covenant and move through what he's accomplished through Christ, but to just live by. There's a reason for that. It's so you don't live by the flesh, guys. It's so you don't stay in the soul. If you treated your kids like we expect God sometime to treat us, we'd say, shame on you. Why do you spoil your children? <laughs> Serious. <laughs> There's a lot of us that think God should be a certain way, but if we treated our kids that way, we'd be mad at ourselves and feel like we ruined them and spoiled them. Who knows that the, for a parent that's in a sincere love, one of the most hardest things, but most wisest and mature things is to not lose heart towards your child. You see where they're heading. You've tried to turn them. They won't turn. And, and you know it's going to be a hard hit but you let them take the hit. You're there for them. You're waiting for their heart to repent, to turn, to say, oh my God, I'm sorry. Can you please help me or whatever? But until that place, your hands are really tied because you know that if you step in premature, it's just going to enable them and they're just going to keep in that place. It's one of the hardest places. Watching a loved one have to go to jail for a small season and keep your heart in a good place of faith where this is going to be the best experience of their life. Rather than, oh my God, you got to keep them out. I can't believe they're going to be in jail. Oh my God. And now you're paying the bail and you're doing this. Next thing you know, now they got two accounts and two crimes over their head. And, and now you're just keeping them out of jail for five years. When probably the best thing they could have been is just go to jail and get sober and have a wake up call. You'd be amazed how love understands that. I'm just going to take this a step farther, and this isn't for everybody, but the reason that's so hard for us sometimes is because we still so draw our identity through those people in our lives. Like, like a lot of mothers, if their kids aren't okay, they can't be okay. Because you can't see your kids by faith. You're seeing your kids by your natural reality, and it's shaking you outside of faith. There's a place for faith. There's a place for... for so. Uh, and, 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 and I'm, not, I'm not focusing, I'm not hitting mother's heart. I'm just saying my experience with a lot of mothers is, like I have one on my, my, my machine a couple of weeks ago just said, keep me in prayer, my son, this and that. And she said, I, of course I went through the whole nervous breakdown thing. I lost myself in this when he did this and did that. I fell apart, I ended up in the hospital, da, da, da. And that's common. Because we're drawing our identity through our children. And we think it's mother love. No, it's drawing your identity. There's a place for you to love like God loves and to be strong and have faith and make confessions of life and not fall apart. There's places as he's going to jail where you say, Father, I thank you that this is the wake-up hour of his life, that he won't be ruined in there, destroyed in there, or touched in a bad way. I thank you you touch him in there. God, as he's still in the night, you come and visit him. Father, I thank you you illuminate his understanding, and he shall fulfill all of your will, and I rejoice. And all of a sudden, you're in faith, so you have life. It's not that you don't care. Some people think if they don't, aren't crying in a sorrowful way, they don't care. What's wrong with me? Why ain't I crying? 
I, honestly, you're not going to see me cry those kind of tears. It's that, that to me is deception. There's a place to be in faith. There's a place to get alone with God and proclaim life and see with clear eyes so that you continue to walk in purpose and bear good fruit and minister the will of God. All the while you're in position for your seed, your offspring to do the same. It says, if I fear the Lord and I keep his commandments, my descendants will be mighty upon the earth. Or I can get my eyes on my descendants, fall apart and not be in faith and fear the Lord. And I can let where their lives are dictate where my life is. And now I need ministry too. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> are you guys all right? Yeah. We might take this yet today. <laughs> I'm just saying, we might. <laughs> For this reason, many are weak, sick, and sleep early. Wow. But if anyone is hungry, it's kind of like uh, this chastised thing, like back in Hebrews. It says, or do you forsake the chastising of the Lord, etc., that if you chastise your sons. In that text right there, he just comes off of the heels of talking about persecution and suffering hostility from sinners against yourself. You understand? It's actually good. It buffeted Paul. It kept him humble. It was in place. God seemed to be good with it and said, my grace is sufficient for you. I told you you'd be persecuted. Stay humble. Just keep preaching my, my word and love not your own life unto death. I think we, we think this chastising thing is always what we've brought up with. Well, you dummy, look what you did wrong. Well, don't you talk. Get to your room. You know, I don't know what you grew up with, but <laughs> most of us can relate. <laughs> when you did wrong, you were strongly told about it. And when you did right, it wasn't that big of a deal. It was just like expected. You follow me, Martha? So I just don't want you to think chastisement of the Lord is him saying, good, I'm glad you're sick. You deserve it. That's like so not true. Well, you made your bed, sleep in it then. That is not the spirit of the Lord. If that was the spirit of the Lord, he'd have never sent his son while we were yet sinners. He'd have been waiting for us to change. Come on. There'd be no thing as mercy. Mercy comes and gets you out of a mess a lot of times. Mercy shows up in the middle. When God's watching you reap what you've sown and things get tight, and even if you're not getting it, and you're still being obstinate and hard-hearted, I've still seen mercy come and touch people at times. Why? Because there's principles. The goodness of God leads men to change. Yeah. If he does it excessively, or if it's just expected, it doesn't bring the change of heart, so it ties God's hand. It restricts the flow of that mercy. But God knows just at the right time and how to show mercy to humble the human heart and change the mind. That's called love. You follow me? But when somebody's really angry and expecting it, and God, you better do this. If you love me, I'm telling you. You're, you're actually putting all oh, the heart of God just so wants to love you. And you're actually putting him in a tight spot because if he does that, you're like the kid in the store that wants the lollipop and the mom said, stop it four times. And now you're on the floor kicking and screaming. And now she pulls the lollipop out and says, you need to knock it off. Here, don't you ever do this again. Yeah, yeah. And then she hands the lollipop. Guess what the kid's going to do the next time they hear no? Because you've just taught them that this is how you get what you want. God will not do that. He's not that weak parent. <laughs> if you kick and scream all day on the floor, he's strong enough and secure enough to just let you squall. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> He will not hand you the lollipop under those conditions because he will be teaching you that that's how you get God to move. <laughs> and you will lay there and cry for years maybe in a mentality that's totally twisted. You follow me? Yes, Ma. Um, when uh, David committed uh, adultery with Bathsheba and um, they, they bore, uh, she bore a child, it says in Second Samuel 12, um, and Nathan departed into house, and the Lord, it says, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore unto David, and it was very sick. And this is not a trap question. When Scripture says the Lord, yeah, 
this is a sincerity of my heart. Uh, the Lord struck the child. Um, who struck the child? Well, the whole testament's full of that language. They have no revelation of Satan, and they have no revelation of the law of sin and death. So we just covered a book of Job. There's all kind of language in the book of Job. If you take it face value, you think the Lord kills people. He's the author and giver of life. He defeated him and destroyed him who has the power of death, and he told us to raise the dead. So God's not in the business of killing. He's in the business of giving life. So regardless, you've got the law of sin and death. You've got no blood of Jesus, and you've got a man reaping what he's sown. So he kills a, man's hus a, wife, a, a woman's husband so he can sleep with her and have her for his own. Well, he already did while he was on the battlefield. So it's a pretty nasty thing David did here. A man after God's heart. Isn't that amazing? And his testimony and legacy. So you can still see mercy all over it because when you look at all the prophecies and all the... It's almost like God praises David all through the Bible. But there's an area here where he got himself in a mess and his heart was smote. He even fasted and laid there, I think, with the child. Is that the one, right? And then he got up and ate and everything. They were, but uh, you have to understand that it's law of sin and death. I know people today that were Christians, got pregnant, Master, I, I could tell you some wild stories. I'm a pastor. And in every situation, I preach repentance. And in most of these situations, the people are crying profusely because they walked into a dark moment and lost identity and did things they thought they'd never do. I don't know what happened to David. God knows. But there's a law of sin and death. There's, he actually killed a man. Actually, David deserved to die. Under their law, David should have been killed. And he wasn't. That's mercy. Lawfully, legally, David should have been killed. Come on, guys. He took a woman that was married, slept with her, got her pregnant. And when he found out she was pregnant, he got the husband killed on the front lines. It sounds like a soap opera. Yeah. And he's the king. And he wasn't running to confess it. Samuel exposed it. Or Nathan, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, Nathan, thank you. And Nathan exposed it. And when he used the parable, David said, show me who that man is. We'll kill him. You tell me you don't see God's mercy all over this. But there was, there was something about the seed. There's something in Old Testament language. But here's the deal. Here's what I want you to get by this comment about the Lord struck, etc. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Oh, I just, watch this. Look at verse 25. This is the cup of the new covenant. New covenant. So watch. Let's just play with this. Let's say God just smote the boy and killed him flat out. <laughs> How's that? Well, in his sovereignty. We're in a new covenant. God smote his son. Not to smote yours. He smote his son so yours could live. We're in a new covenant. You really better understand the New Covenant before you spend a lot of time in the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament, I hear Perry Stone say this one time. He said, the Old Testament's the New Testament concealed. The New Testament's the Old Testament revealed. It's because it's all pointing to Christ, to the covenant to come, to the new and living way. So if you, I've, I've talked to people that read all the Old Testament and they think God's schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because one day he's showing mercy and the next day he's killing 10,000 people and the next day he's in a good mood and he's pouring out blessing and the next day he's just opening the ground and swallowing up people because they're obstinate. Right. It's the law of sin and death. It's teaching us that apart from Christ and following him, man in and of himself is a mess. And he reaps what he sows. The law tutored us to the need for a savior. 
So people would be in the wilderness and serpents would come out of the blue, fiery, ha, and they die. And people go, oh my God, we sinned again. We sinned, help, ah! And it would lead them to a place of heart cry and change and repentance. See what I mean? But it really didn't actually change, change their hearts. It, it just put them in a jam. So this new covenant is designed to change your heart because it's love. So it's almost like, what do you want? Do you want the law of sin and death? And do you want to just reap what you sow? Or do you want covenant and love and reap what he sowed? So with the question, let me have fun with it. Let's say God killed the boy. Let's just say God killed the boy. In the new covenant, he killed his own boy. You see God taking Abraham's son up onto a mountain. The mountain of Moriah. It's, it's actually in, it was in the land of present-day Jerusalem. It, it, was, it had to be the same mountain. You got Abraham and his only son with wood on his back, climbing a mountain, painting a picture that was to come. It's amazing. <laughs> and he's asking him to give his only son, and Abraham's going, fine, he's the promise, he's the seed. God promised, and even if he... That has me sacrifice him. He'll raise him from the dead because he's the promise of God. So he's heading up and right when he gets there, Abraham stays his hand and provides a ram but prophesies that he's going to send his son. You didn't hold nothing back from me. That's not your son that I need to die. It's my son that needs to die. <laughs> he's the author and giver of life. So please don't be confused, deceived, or puzzled by Old Testament language. Make sure you understand the new so you can read the old and glean from it. Because if you read the old apart from the new, you're probably going to be confused and you're going to let the devil talk you into a mess. You follow me? I've seen people cry. They're pregnant. Crazy situations. Pregnant to somebody's husband. Do I need to go further? All kinds of stuff. I could, I've, I, you're not shocked after a while what's really going on out there. I, I just heard of one where, oh, okay, yeah. He said, don't, it's just too, it doesn't even need repeated. But I've watched people cry, partake of this, and their babies are fine even with destiny and calling in them. You follow me? But their root was, their root in the natural was what? Sin and willfulness. And, and yet God turns that into great glory. Because life comes from Him. Because if it was that legalistic, a lot of us wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> you know why I'm here? Certainly, I'm predestined before time, etc. But in the natural, I'm here because my dad just went into my mom. They were young, confused. He's a drunk, and she's pretty to him. I'm just telling you, that's not too spiritual. But here I am. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus is right. Are you guys all right? So, we are not under the law of sin and death. In fact, just in light of that question, I just want you to look at Romans 8 quick, and we're going back here to Corinthians, and we're going to try to take communion before the break. Okay. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Paul's talking about in Romans 7, and man, I can't get into all that again. We covered all that in the school, but he's talking about the, the, the sin and, and, and wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. He didn't say, he, listen to what he said, who will deliver me. He didn't say, who will cover over me? 
who will put up and tolerate my pitiful condition? He said, who will deliver me? I am not sin waiting to happen. I'm a son empowered to manifest him. If my faith and my perspective and understanding is clear. I'm not a slave to sin. The Bible says I'm free in regards to sin. I'm a slave to righteousness. Why? Because Jesus has delivered me from that body of death. He didn't cover my sin. He took it away. Are you following me? So don't misunderstand the language of Romans 7. If you read 6, 7, and 8, you can't possibly make a mistake. And he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, this is what confuses people, this comment. With the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin, they say, see, see, I'm damned to sin. It's, it's in me, it's in my flesh. He's going into the very next verse saying, you don't live by the flesh. And the whole Romans 8 is you live by the Spirit. Because you've lived by the Spirit, it's life and peace. If you live by the flesh, it's death. You don't live by the flesh. He's not saying you're damned to sin. He's saying when you think according to the flesh and live by your own strength, your own ingenuity, your own wisdom, then you're left alone to sin. You following? But when I understand the gospel, I understand Christ, watch this. There's now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh. So he's not damning you in verse 25 and saying, well, God knows how we are. He know, the verse before he delivered you from it. And now he's telling you don't live by the flesh because if you live by the flesh, you're going to serve the law of sin. But if you live by faith and you live by grace, you're going to live by the Spirit. When, when you look up here living by the Spirit, it actually means to live by grace, to live by the working of, of grace in your life and letting Christ qualify you and righteousness adorn you. And as you fix on righteousness and your identity gets groomed as a son, you begin to be a good tree and you bear good fruit. That's all. We covered this a lot in the school, but we're here today and it seems like grace to be here. For the law, this is what I want you to see. The law of the Spirit of what? So is God killing people? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from what happened to David. How's that? Do you see it? Yeah. Yay. Now watch. For what the law could not do, just you serving God through the flesh. What the law, that's why works is so, uh, that's why people just trying to earn their, their favor, earn their salvation, earn God's... Uh, Ah, it's such a zero. For what the law could not do, could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Remember, we're delivered from this. <laughs> God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He never sinned. He was in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous, this is where you and I come in, this is amazing, this is where faith comes in, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh. That means I'm not a sinner. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Grace is empower me. I have no excuse for the flesh. I have a reason to live by the Spirit. I'm a son. I'm called by God. I have destiny. I'm going to write a legacy. You get it? Not according, they, live, they don't live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of flesh. Do you see that verse 25 of Romans 7 is that the, the, if you live by the flesh, you're going to serve the law of sin. But if you live by the Spirit, you're going to fulfill and walk in righteousness. He fulfilled the righteous requirement, but you're going to fulfill that righteous identity by living by faith. And it empowers you to not sin, guys, because he says, should we just sin because we're under grace and not the law? Well, no! 
So it's not an out. It's not just an exception Say, well, it's fine, just live the way you live, but just believe God loves you. That's not what we're teaching. When you understand you're righteous, you begin to bear the fruit of righteousness. You're not going to continue in sin. You died to it. You're living by the Spirit. Do you understand? That way, there's no just practice of and, and continue and habitual of sin. If, if anything, we just bump into it along the way and go, oh, that is so not who you are in me. And we turn and we sit on daddy's lap and we receive his love and get wiser and sharper and more mature and we love him all the more because he's amazing. Or you drag your lip, condemn yourself, and talk yourself out of truth, and take off your robe, and get naked and ashamed. Why would you do that? You look so good in your robe. <laughs> you follow me? Let's go back quick to Corinthians. Did you have something, Anthony, or something? I just realized you got the mic. I don't know. Now we're on. Uh, when my youngest son... I got a gal pregnant back four or five years ago. It was hard because of what was taught, what I'd been taught. Right. About child out of wedlock, da da da, da 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 stuff, bastard child, all that kind of stuff. Until a uh, pastor, uh, former pastor of mine, started sharing some stuff, and the Lord gave me some revelation about it's not about that. It's a, I mean, part of it was about everybody's called forth at a certain time, a certain point in, in the history of time and the destination of that child to be born in certain periods in time. And God started just revealing some things about that. It's, you know, and it just changed my whole perspective because it was like, what did you do kind of thing, you know. Right. Well, as a parent, you want things to be in order. You want things to be right. You don't want things to be chaotic. You know what I'm saying? What we don't want to do is just have a disregard for that and say, oh, God will work it out. God will make it right. With David's case, when Martha brought that up about David, you find that when Nathan shared, David was in no place of repentance. You might be amazed the scenario and how it had turned out if David's heart would have been broken. He was in godly sorrow. And the day after he killed uh, uh, Uriah, he would have been like, Oh my God, what did I do? Oh my God, and he'd have fell on his face, tore his clothes, sackcloth as his fast, and, and, and just praying to God for mercy. You might be amazed what might have happened. I've, I've, I've pastored long enough to know this, that when people get caught and exposed in things, it's a tougher, tougher place because they're hiding. They are not repentant. They are not changing. And there's a different working of things sometimes. When somebody comes out into the light and cries, it makes it a whole lot easier. When a husband comes to me crying and saying, I'm bound, man. I've been in this vice of pornography and it's so bad and my wife has no idea. Or watch this one. And I, could get, I, I remember lots of examples of this one because of the way I preach. I don't cut people's heads off, man. I go for reconciliation and restoration. And people can say you're being too lenient. Well, we'll find out someday. But I believe God's been pretty lenient with us. But a husband come to me weeping. Oh my God, I got tangled up. I got close to my coworker. And they're bawling. And this has happened, man. And I say, man, you slept with her. Yeah. And I know the families. I know the people most of the time. I know the wife or the husband. And it's the wife. I just felt like he didn't love me. I just got scared. He, he started to show me attention and he's just... You know what I mean? And they come crying, broken, and confess it to you. When that all gets exposed and comes out in the light, sometimes there's not the greatest reaction from the other spouse in the beginning, but the fact that they came clean and confessed it means a whole lot in the, in the big picture. But in the situations that I found where it gets exposed and the person gets caught. There's usually a, a mess and a struggle and it's usually not even a good scene. Because in the other spouse, it's like, well, you don't care. There's no repentance. Well, you just got caught. Da, da, da. And they, they have a hard time embracing mercy and grace in that place because they feel like they'll just do it again. They don't even care. There, there's no repentance. 
See what I'm saying? But in the situation where people understand the gospel and somebody came clean and broke and truly cried and came clean, I've seen those work out in amazing ways. The other ones can work out, but it's a precarious place because repentance is very important, changing your mind. Finding a place of godly sorrow. It's actually, it's called a gift. It's, it's that God might grant you repentance, being ensnared by the devil, being held captive to do his will. That we're to be gentle and pray and, and believe and not just crucify people, but we ought to be in faith and praying and believing. At least God, you know, uh, grant a gift of repentance and turn their hearts so their way changes. It's in Timothy. Isn't that awesome? But it says they've been snared and held captive by the devil to do his will. But in the ones where people got caught, and that's what happened to David. So there's really no repentance there. You show me, down through the history of the Bible, Old Testament and New, where people were sincere and cried out for mercy and were godly sorrowful and asked for repentance, even under the law of sin and death, God showed amazing mercy. True? Where did he just go, nope, you pushed me too far? No, I don't want to hear it. No, I heard that two months ago. I don't want to hear it again. Where? Oh, well, yeah. There's a, there's a, that's a whole other teaching. There's a significance there. He was totally forgiven. Oh, he's so highly honored. He's so highly honored. Yeah, well, yeah, but there's a reason for that. We can talk about that later. I can't open that up now. But don't you do that to me with them questions. <laughs> okay, let's receive this right now. If anyone's hungry, let him eat at home. Did you hear that? No, you guys are coming to the snack bar. And then, and then Susan's going to ring the bell over and over and over and over and over. And people are still eating and snacking. And I said, I'm serious. I got a complex. The food's way better than my preaching. I said, I'm just going to go set up the pulpit out there. And I'll just preach while you're eating. <laughs> Look at you. That's a good idea. <laughs> If anyone's hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. That means, why put yourself in a position where your heart's wrongly motivated? Make sure you have a pure heart in all things you do and have the right purpose for doing what you're doing. Do you see what he's saying in this whole chapter? And if we're not discerning the body as much as we are the blood, that's probably not a good thing because we eat of the flesh and drink of the blood. John 6. Amen. John 6 is a very powerful chapter. It would be a good one to read. He says, oh, look at this. He says, and the rest I will set in order when I come. Oops. <laughs> there must have been some serious issues in the Corinthian church. I'll address this one in this whole chapter, and I'll help the church through the ages with it. But the rest I'm dealing with you personally. <laughs> so there was some issues. But thank God he addressed this. Isn't this good that he addressed this one? Do you see why God had him address this? Because it really helps us today in 2011, doesn't it? At least we just do it traditionally and religiously. I was in a Catholic church doing a five minute, they gave me five minutes at a funeral because they do a mass, a funeral mass. They have a, a, a procedure in the incense in the whole nine yards. Two kids just went through an intersection, missed the stop sign, a Mack truck just, it was a big feed truck that was carrying a whole bunch of corn. It just, down on 74, it was terrible. It was a tragedy. Those kids had just come to my home group Catholic background and got so touched by the word and they, they got saved and and for a month they, they were full of life their hearts were changed and the parents noticed it and were like oh my gosh and a month into it and it's the, one of those puzzling things they just boom next thing you know you get a call they're both dead and it was bad I mean they just got plowed by the truck well the family knew that they were coming to my house and saw the change in their life when they came to my house and they asked me to help at the funeral and just say a couple words. And I didn't know how that fit in the Catholic setting. I went back in the back room. The priest is there getting dressed. for the, And I just walked in. I'm just me. You know, I don't, I'm young in the Lord. I don't know. I don't even think I was pastoring at the time. I think it was before I was even pastoring. I was probably saved a year and a half, maybe two. And uh, I walked in the back and I said, uh, 
hey, excuse me, are, are, are you the minister? Of it? And, and he said, uh, I'm Father so-and-so. I said, who? Because I don't know. I didn't know what to call him. And he said, who are you? And I told him. And it was, it was just a funny moment because uh, he said, uh, oh, you're the fellow the family asked to speak. Well, they were showing me great grace to let me speak in the middle of a Catholic. And there I am, pretty non-assuming, just standing there, and I'm about as <laughs> uneducated and about unknowing as you can get, man. I would scare some people in that situation. Because <laughs> like, he said, oh, he said, okay. He said, and I didn't answer him right. I didn't know. I wasn't trying to stretch him. He said, what exactly are you going to say? And I said, man, I don't know. I said, but I'm really just trusting, you know, that, that it'll come out just right when I get up there and God will just give me direction. Because that's how I've lived my whole life. So I'm telling this guy that's showing me grace to get in the middle of this mass, or, or beginning, end, middle, whatever, and he's like wanting to know out of courtesy for his position what I'm going to say and I can't tell him. That was not good. When you saw his eyes and he looked at me, I thought, this ain't flying. And I thought, oh, I just scared him. And... He, I said, well, that, sir, would be totally up to you. Look, I am not here to get in the way of anything. I'm just obliging the family. Had got to know the kids in my home. They had a good experience there. There was a lot of good things happening in their life, and the parents noticed it, and they attributed it to that and those meetings. Oh, okay, fine, good, good. He said, let me see. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, I think you'll fit in the best right after the Eucharist. And I went, oh, Oh, okay. I didn't have a clue. The Eucharist. I was like, the Eucharist. Would you have known? You'd have done the same thing during the headlight, wouldn't you? Oh, okay. Well, when he looked in my eyes, he could tell he was a wise man. He could tell that I had no clue what he just said. And he's probably all the more scared. And he said, the Holy Communion? I went, oh, yeah, the Eucharist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was so clueless. But watch what happened immediately. Because I understood this. And I understood that I got to do this right after this. And this is the reason those kids were different. And I thought, this is God. Oh, I was so pumped. And then he looked at me and said, Now you know you have five minutes. And I'm like, Yeah. <laughs> Not a problem. And I really wanted to honor that. So I only took four. I really did. But I got up there and I poured out my heart and I shared the little history in, in a minute and a half or two of the kids just so they knew. And I opened up to John 6 and read a section of eating the flesh and drink the blood. I said, guys, we just partook of something so amazing. And if we're not careful, it'll become a simple tradition and we'll lose the power of his life-changing grace. And, ah, and I'm preaching. They never hear preaching. And I'm explaining and pouring out my heart. The whole place was undone and captivated. Life just went. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was unbelievable. Four minutes. Four minutes. They took those caskets up the middle and they're following with their incense and everybody's like, you know, you know, weeping their death and stuff and, and, and they were all supposed to channel out and follow and they were going to go right to the cemetery and I'm sitting over in the wing where I was out of the way because I had to slide up there and out. But when I turned, when I, I get, took four minutes, right? And then on my way across, I glanced over at the priest there and he went, like, good job. <laughs> Because I know I had him scared. God had mercy on that man. I mean, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to say. Eucharist. Huh? He's like, this guy is in my church. When the thing was ending, and this is the second time I experienced it in a, well, it was, this was the first time. The second time was at a wedding with a Catholic congregation. And I'm not saying anything negative or bad about Catholics, but what happened was, they didn't, most of them didn't go up the middle aisle. It was unbelievable. They just went and surrounded me. 
They were all around me. It was a sea of them. And they were weeping. And they said, what's happening? What was happening when you were speaking? What was going on when you were up there? And they were crying. And I just started to share. And it was like I had to actually direct them to follow because they wanted, it's almost like they forgot what they were there for. Captivate. I was in a wedding like that. And with my eyes, I saw Holy Spirit manifest in a form. It was, it was neat. He, he's, he's not those forms. He, he came like a dove. It doesn't mean he's a dove. But I saw him with my eyes. And I don't talk about this stuff a lot because people chase that stuff, make fads out of that stuff. But he did it. I saw it. He split in two. He married some folks. And then it looked like he turned, it's like he was rain. It was, it was amazing. It looked, like two, it looked like a stream of smoke came over my shoulders, went like this together, split, went around the married couple, tied them, went out over the congregation as a, as a cloud, and then dissipated and sprinkled on everybody. I watched it. It was amazing. And, I'm, I, and it was all set up anyway through the counseling and it was in a marvelous time. And I didn't help the bride and groom at all when the smoke thing happened and they tied, they're, they're going, they're crying. And I leaned in and said, I told you he would come. So I just stoked the fire a little bit. <laughs> and, but these people I found out later were all Catholic, predominantly 90 some percent of them. And they have a real reverence for God. They might not have the understanding that you think you might have, but I'll tell you what I've noticed. A lot of them have a real reverence for God. And when His presence came, when the bride and groom were leaving out, and it's the, it's the, it's the reception line now. Everybody's all excited. Hey, you're beautiful. Oh my God, congratulations, man. It wasn't happening. They're leaving. The ushers are going like this, and the people are getting up and going this way. It was absolutely crazy. I had everybody around me. Tears. What's happening? What's going on? What am I feeling and sensing right now? What just happened? And I was just telling them how alive he is and how real and how he just tied them together and that when they did their vows, I explained and he came. I go, oh my God, that's the Lord. That was the Lord. Yeah, he's here. He lives inside of us, guys. He's not way out there. I'm just preaching to the whole congregation. And then I had to like, come on, let's go say hi to the bride and groom. You know, let's go, let's go hug somebody. (laughs) Seriously, it was getting comical because we were on the outside on the edge of a hill and the hill went down and they're standing there and the bride was rocking. And when this happened, I'm sure it's on video because they videoed the whole thing. The best man was backslid and the next guy was backslid. When Holy Spirit went over my shoulders, he got knocked over. And all they did was play the piano. And I just said, we're going to get quiet and we're going to invite the presence of God to come and Holy Spirit's going to come and join these two. And I proclaimed it. And I said, when she begins to play, we're going to get our hearts in a place and he will come. And as soon as he touched the keys, he went Like a wind literally blew across my hair. And I'm like, oh. And the guy goes, poof. And the other guy goes, poof. And they fall right into each other. And they're holding each other. (laughs) They're both backslidden. They came to me so broken at the end. They were like, dude, oh my God. (laughs) So on the way through to marry them, he just went, love you guys. How sweet is that? It's just like, you know, one of just, it's just, I really am real and you know it, right? <laughs> oh my goodness. So it's so, just relationship, it's amazing. Come on, let's do this. Let's do this and take a break. You ready, Patty? Are you? On the night he was betrayed, what did he do? He took bread. If you want to break that and just, just remember him, just the beating, the flogging, the, the punishment. 
man, I do that when I'm alone sometimes. I just break it and I'm like, God, you really did what you did. It really did please him, didn't it, Donna? It pleased him to bruise his son so he could get to us. We've always been his kids. We've, we've never left his heart. We might have left his way, but we never left his heart. He, he never lost sight of us, guys. And he paid whatever price necessary to get us back and redeem us and bring us home. No matter how we scuffed our knees along the way, no matter how we got bit along the path of life, his body was broken to bring wholeness, restoration, and redemption. To restore our lives, guys, as if we've never sinned or ate the tree or never walked away. As if we never left the Father's house in the first place. Man, what a joyous day when you come up over the hill and Father sees you coming. And every price was paid for your reconciliation and redemption. And he robes you and he puts a signet ring on your finger and sandals on your feet and celebrates your return. There was a brother there that said, you know, why a party for him? Don't you realize when he was out there, he was dead? But now he's returned and he's alive. You ought to rejoice. He was dead, but now he lives. (laughs) Jesus died so we can live. Lord Jesus, we stand here and honor you as a class, a school. And even as individuals from our hearts, we say thank you for a gospel as good as this. Thank you for a message that seems too good to be true. But it is true. Thank you for our redemption. Thank you for our healing. Thank you for wholeness. Thank you for the scars, the stains, the memories of sin. And everything that it brought to our lives, the fall of man, removed because you took the major hit. And because you raised from the dead, we're justified. We do this. We remember you. And we thank you. And we take it with all our heart. In Jesus' name. Go ahead, guys. Be thankful. Talk to him. Be personal. Don't just follow right now. Be engaged. Thank you. He held up the cup. Said, it's the new covenant in my blood. Wonder if the blood is enough. Wonder if the blood settled the fact. (laughs) Wonder if it's all finished. Wonder if the truth about us is found through Jesus crucified and raised from the dead. Wonder if the blood revealed it all. That he would die for me to redeem me and restore me. That he would shed his blood so life could come back into mine. The first thing he did, raised from the dead, is take his blood to the mercy seat in John 20. Shoot back to earth and take, tell his guys, peace to you. He told Mary, go tell my brethren. What do you mean my brethren? Didn't Peter just deny me? Didn't they all scatter when I was struck? Where were they when I needed them the most? That isn't what he said. He said, go tell my brothers. I'm going to my God and their God, to my father and their father. When he came back, he said, peace to you. As the father sent me, I send you. And then he breathed life back into men. Why? Why? Because this cup's enough. And he made it as if man never ate the tree. As if sin never happened. He washed it away. It's a new covenant in his blood. And we honor you, Jesus. Oh my goodness, thank you. Thank you. Ah. Take a break. Right now. <laughs> Miss Lori's coming. <laughs> oh, everybody go. <laughs> yeah, that's how I'm feeling. Oh, I don't know. I feel like I want to take a nap now. That was just so refreshing. <laughs> but. Here we are. (laughs) It's Monday, and we're excited about Monday. Pastor, why are you sitting back there? Come up here with me. Don't hide in the corner. I always scare him when he knows I'm up to something. 
<laughs> he says, we'll oh pray my for you, Pastor. Gosh, that's what she says. <laughs> Um, can you move Pastor Dan? Because he's so much taller. Can you move his little podium thing out of the way? Because if I stand there, they won't see me. <laughs> <laughs> you can go up to the high places. I can go up here. That's right. But then, we, then I, you won't see these wonderful, beautiful banners. I love these banners. I love just showing God off. <laughs> anyway, Amen. I want to show something else off right now. Um, this school is over halfway gone. <sighs> I know. That's what I feel like, too. I, I don't get to be in here as often, but I get to see it on the Internet on days that I'm not in here. And, and wow, I can't. Hmm, it's, it's just been, hasn't it? Um, a new school is starting up in, in um, the end of October. So if you're available and those of you that are watching online, a uh, new school starts the end of October and with a whole new lineup, it takes an awful lot to put this together. Some of you know that, even from the moving of the tables and setting the tables up and tearing them down and getting the church ready from week to week and, and doing different things. And we've got an awesome administrator. Yeah. Come up here, Miss Sue. Yeah. Let's show some honor this morning. Come on. It's a setup. Yes, it is. Yeah, don't stand up there. I'm already short. <laughs> there we go. Um, it does. Sue has been working laboriously for you all for long before you all came um, with finding houses and tuition, rewriting the handbook, um, figuring out the online, doing, helping Josh's input with the website. There's just been so much that goes into making this happen from day to day to day to day. And we just want to give honor where honors do. And um, I want to appreciate and so, sh so much love for what you're doing here. So we want to say, we can't hold this mic and do this at the same time, I don't know. But God. Yay, God, God. for Sue, too. Thank you. She is an amazing person. Yeah. Yay, God, for her and for God. And she is such a princess, a daughter of the king. You have to take it out and show them because they can't see it. And it's one of my favorite pieces from the store. So check out the store if you like what Miss Sue got. All about him, daughter of the king. <laughs> it says it's all it says princess thank you thank you she is a princess daughter of the king and because of her laboring efforts here we want her to take a weekend off with her wonderful husband We have a trip coming up to Sight and Sound. We want to make sure you and Pat get to go. Thank you. We want to make sure you get to stay there at one of the suites and have dinner on all of us. <laughs> That's good. So enjoy yourself and thank you so much. Thank you. you. We can't You're even tell you how much goes into this, that she labors. The emails, my gosh, um, the emails that, that many of you are sending in, thank you. <laughs> but a lot of times, um, these things go just as because. But it's throughout the days. Late into the evenings, I'm getting emails because I get them on my phone and they go, ding. <laughs> and mm -hmm. Sue's sending me emails late into the night of responses from emails because the emails are coming from around the country and the country doesn't work on world, thank you, and the world doesn't work on America time, so that works on their time. But thank you so much. We honor you, we love you. I just, uh, I'll make sure you get your whole, your, your break, okay? I'll give you time, this isn't your break. 
<laughs> so, but I want to say this is just uh, an incredible experience for me, and I wouldn't have it any other way. And it's it's a lot of work, but it's not hard work. It's it's so rewarding. The phone calls I get from people, um, the emails I get, that the, their lives are being transformed. Um, I'm honored. I'm just so honored that Pastor Don and Pastor Laurie have. Um, bestowed upon me, allowed me to do this. It's just a joy and a pleasure, um, and I wouldn't have it any other way. And um, my reward comes from seeing transformed lives. That's what it's all about. So God bless you. Take a break before I cry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bells. I think we should just make it a lifetime appointment. <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> She's one of my favorites. Yeah, all of you. Everybody's God's favorite, aren't they? Pastor used to say he loves everybody, but I'm his favorite. It's funny. Thank you, Jesus. You're absolutely awesome. Yeah, really love you, Lord. Isn't it good? Thanks for just, I, well, I know you didn't have much say in it. I went where I went this morning, but thanks, thanks for bearing with me and uh, taking that long to, yeah, I just got into some heart stuff. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so do I. Father, whatever you want to do this second, this last hour, it's not even an hour. Just thank you, because there's a lot of places we can go right now. There's some things I had on my mind, but Father, we just yield to you. We really want to know you more. Just continue to build us up in your kingdom in understanding and revelation in your unfailing love. I'm really asking this, Lord, let us be identified through you and by you and nothing else. The mistakes that people make, the things they do they should never do, the things they say that should never be said. God, help us to see that for what it really is and let our hearts be filled with your love and just let us be strong in you. I'm just asking, Lord God, that the barometer of our life would be your finished work and your unfailing love for us that we would be so strong in identity, so strong in understanding that nothing would ever shake us or move us again. God, I thank you. We're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So let us be established and firmly founded in truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. And it's just true. I don't want grace to miss my life, guys. I've prayed for years. I've, I've, I used to pray it with so much tears that I had to... Sometimes you can strive in your passion. Like <laughs> the Bible uses the word strive to enter into his rest. Yeah, ceasing from your works like he did on the seventh day, right? But uh, I used to get real, uh, Todd used to get in the car and he'd say, I need this so bad, dude, I gotta have this. I'd say, I understand your hunger's good. And I would say, be careful this and this because it would get to a place where it, 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 was, it was, yeah, it was extreme. And the hunger's good, but you don't want it to produce negative stuff. Like to where you're feeling like there's nothing happening in your life. You build on what God's doing, amen, what God's saying. But I used to sit at home and it would get, I would cry easy. It would just make me cry right away. And uh, it's funny how you talk about, you know, emotion comes right in you. But I would sit all alone and I would, just tears roaring down my face and I would say this. I'd say, I was so sincere. I just, I, I knew what I was saying had something to it, you know. I would say, Lord, please don't let one drop of grace available through the life of Jesus Christ given miss my life. Make me what's possible. Make me what's available. Mold me into what you accomplished and don't let my own mind sell it short. I don't want one drop of grace to fall to the ground. That's the way I would pray. It's really a neat way to pray. Because it, it'll expose the way that seems right to a man. It'll expose human reasoning and stuff like that along the way. Because grace does that. When you're praying, when you're releasing faith, grace starts etching you, remember? And as you're doing that, then limited thoughts, ways that seem right to a man. <gasps> you know, I said to these people last, this past weekend when I was down there, because I, I was preaching the word on Sunday, man. They, they were letting me have some freedom. And I was just really preaching the word. And the scriptures were just rolling and I quoted like four scriptures and they're all just sitting there and I said, 
Do you understand that is all the word of God, everything I just said? Do you understand I'm not just talking English? That's the word of God? And they were like, yeah. And then I told them where all the scriptures were. I went bam, bam, bam. And, and, and they're all kind of like getting impressed with that. Like, this guy really knows the Bible. Well, I wasn't doing it for that. It was just in my heart. And I said, guys, right now some of you are thinking this and about it. I said, no. I said, here's the deal. I said, if I don't know truth, how can I defend against a lie? I said, it's important to fill your heart with the word. If I don't have a foundation of truth, how can I ever expose a lie or defend against a lie? How will I even know it's a lie? I said, I'll be sold so short. I'll sell so cheap. I used that phrase all weekend, selling cheap, selling cheap. And what that means. And man, you should have saw their hearts responding. And I said, if I'm not filled with truth... What standard am I going to live by? What, what's going to determine my wisdom? If I'm not filled with his word and renewed the spirit of my mind, how will I ever fight and wage a good war? True? Because your emotions will sell you short, your feelings. A good friend will just speak out of their emotions because they're sentimental towards you. And because they're a good friend, you'll tend to grab it because you're emotional at that point. You follow what I'm saying? See, I got real, this thing is it's on me right now. It's so funny how God works. As soon as I said it, it's just there. This thing rose up in me. and I'm like, try to lie to me now. You just let the devil slip up and try to tell me what I'm not or who I am and who I'm not apart from that word. And I will take off its head because it doesn't have a voice now. Try to come and talk me out of my encouraged heart. You come and try to talk me out of his love. You come and talk me out of destiny. It ain't happening. Because <laughs> every word will fall to the ground. It's all a lie because I'm founded in truth. You get what I'm saying? Do you know how we entertain that stuff and even sometimes feed that stuff quietly in the quiet place of our life? Okay. Luke, Luke chapter 10. I need to, need to go here. We're going to start here. We're going to probably stay here this week pretty much. Thank you, God. Not, not in Luke 10, but in, we're going to kick off and stay in this concept all week. Thank you, Father. We covered this a lot last week, this kind of stuff. I wanted to show you all through the Gospels where there was unlimited promises, right? Where Jesus healed all. You, could, you can go right into the book of Acts and you can find how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went around doing healing all, doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil. It's pretty clear, isn't it? There's actually some people that would take that and think that, well, he was healing the ones who were oppressed by the devil, but the ones that are oppressed by God, he, he wasn't going to heal them. There's a thought like that out there, like God does both. The devil and God work kind of hand in hand. There's no fellowship between God and the devil. The Bible says that, between light and dark. There's zero. He's a God of light and there's no darkness in him. follow me don't mix it up we've called him the thief he doesn't steal kill and destroy he gives life he gave his son it's his good pleasure his good pleasure to give you the kingdom I think that's right there in Luke Luke 11 somewhere isn't it but it says it says fear not little flock it's your it's the father's good pleasure to give you what What's his good pleasure? To give you the kingdom, the king's domain. So, is Luke 12? Yeah, I knew it was somewhere real close there. I could smell it. It was right there. So close. I was on point. But go to Luke 10. <laughs> Don't be hanging out there in 12. You'll get reading it. It's so good. You'll, I'll lose you. 
That's what I do, man. Did you ever sit and hear somebody preaching and they take you to scripture and then they're still preaching and you're reading that three, four verses. Next thing you know, you're cross-referencing and you're two chapters over and they just made three points and you don't even know what they said. Oh my goodness, it happens to me. I confess it all the time. I'm off on my little journey. God, that's so good. There's more. Forgive me, Jesus. Okay, so in Matthew 10, he sent out his disciples. We knew that. Uh, he told them to preach the kingdoms here and heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, and cast out devils. For freely you have... Wow. So if it wasn't God's will to give us those things, how could we ever give those things? God said, freely you've received, so it must be in the kingdom. The kingdom is here. So healing, deliverance, freedom, it comes through the... It's in the kingdom. So, man, he's good. So he says, you've received it, so give it. One of the greatest things you can do, one of the greatest things you can do when you're not completely in wholeness, when you feel sick, when you have a situation in your body you haven't seen changed, one of the greatest things you can do is pray for the sick. Because it's your statement that I believe the word in a greater way than what I'm experiencing. And I honor God's word way above what's happening right now. And, and I'm in position to receive and be healed. And the fact that I believe is evidenced in the fact that I'm going to pray for the sick. That is not, and I stressed this in the school before, that is not hypocrisy. Praying for the sick while you're sick. Hypocrisy is play acting. Hypocrisy is wearing a mask. Hypocrisy is acting like something you're not. When you're praying for the sick, you're not claiming to know it all. And it doesn't mean that you're perfectly well in your body. It just means you're honoring the word and you believe the word's true above your own life. And that you're going to continue to pray the sick. It's the greatest expression of faith to me. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Most people that have an ailment or a situation refuse to pray for the sick because they're so conscious of their own struggle. And they say, well, I can't pray for the sick because I can't even get healed of me. How can I pray for the sick and believe when I can't even believe for me? Well, you're not trying to believe. You're in a position of faith. Faith is the position of your heart to receive what he accomplished. Faith is a lifestyle. It's a mentality. It's a perspective. Are you following me? Faith isn't something you're struggling for. It's not something you're trying to find under a rock. I'm not being sarcastic. I'm just using that as an example. It's, it's not something that's out there lost you're trying to bump into. And until you find it, you're not qualified to pray for anybody because look at my own life. That's what people say. Do you hear how rational that is? And how that mindset seems right to a man and produces zero life? Do you, do you see how easy we're scammed? How quick we sell cheap? Because we go, well, yeah, but let me think about that. That is a scary place most of the time. <laughs> to muddle over the, muse over the word, and, 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 and that's all good. But to just say, let me think, apart from him and truth. Well, yeah, but I'm sick. I mean, who am I to pray for the sick? I can't even get this for myself. How can I believe for anybody else? I can't, I can't pray for the sick until I get myself straightened out. And then you're on this self-focus, this striving, feeling disqualified, feeling at bay, feeling on the bench. It's not a good place. And I've seen countless people in that place. So that's just as we begin this thing here, because we're going to talk all week about you and I ministering the kingdom and shining his lights and loving people. It's why you're on the planet, by the way. It's why you're here. It's to love people. To be loved by God, to love God and love people. That's why you're alive. Period. That's amazing. What a joy. So, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you haven't received yet. It matters that you believe God's word. Because even if you've not received yet and you believe God's word, your heart's in a position of faith and confidence. You still have joy. You're still in fellowship with God. If you're not in that place, you've got 20 questions, intimacy subverted, and you're confused. And you're not even having relationship. You're just conscious of what you're not receiving and what you're not getting and what am I doing wrong and I've got to try harder. Well, I need to get this, brother. No, you need to take a deep breath, relax, and receive the love of God. <laughs> 
<laughs> Are you okay with that? Can I talk like that? Is that okay? I didn't offend anybody, I hope. No, it's serious. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Because the worst thing you can do is turn this into a method or an abracadabra or a genie in a bottle or a way to get a better life. You'll be disappointed if it's that. You'll be 30-day money-back guarantee kind of people. You'll be like waiting for God to prove it. Just 60-day try me, see if you like me. No, we're in this for life. Faith is a lifestyle. It's not something you do. It's something you live. You get this? You follow the simplicity of what I'm saying right now? So here's the deal. So you do have an ailment in your body. I'm not saying it's, 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 it's who knows that, that can bug you sometimes. If I had an ailment in my body, I'm just telling you, I'm a pretty emotional fella, it would bug me. But it wouldn't overtake me, it wouldn't rob my identity, it wouldn't get me to struggle and strive in that sense. It would actually draw me to his love. It would actually get me to respond in him. It would actually, I would allow that. That would be a, a tool, a stepping stone, if you will. It would take me to him. You following what I'm saying? To where I'm like, Father, I so appreciate what you've accomplished. What you've accomplished is settled, it's sure, and I'm receiving it. I thank you that, Father, I realize through your word this has nothing to do with my creative value. It is your will, and I thank you that you're breathing life into me. You're, you're strengthening me. God, I thank you. You're making all things new. Your love for me is incredible. <sighs> and I'll wake up the same way. And I'm going to walk out that thing. Okay? Okay. Please, I know what I'm hearing right now. I can hear some thoughts rattling <laughs> in the room. Please don't judge what I'm saying and compare what I'm saying to your circumstance and give yourself a reason to not be in faith. Say, well, yeah, but you haven't been in anything for as long as I have and you haven't been faced with it. If you start comparing yourselves among yourselves, you'll give yourself an out and you'll fail to pursue truth. You follow me? Be real careful that you don't exempt yourself from relationship and love. And come up with a reason why you can't or why it's hard or yeah, but you don't understand. When you do that, you give occasion for the flesh. You, you actually suppress your spirit, man. You actually justify whatever's not good, whatever you're not doing good with. Are you okay if I'm talking this plain? You good? Now that language is cheap and I hear it a lot and it's not that we're evil, willful, we're good people. It's just, it's the way that seems right. And then we start justifying weakness instead of pursuing strength. I'm just talking as plain as I can for, for our sakes. I'm not, if you get offended with what I'm saying, that, that's, that's, that already reveals something. You, that you're just taking what I'm saying personal because you've already become that. So please hear me in the heart of where I'm talking from. You follow what I'm saying? I've ministered truth to people over the years and they get vehement. They get very angry. You know, a lot of people love me, but you either love me or hate me. It's one or the other. Serious. I, and I like that because I, I don't want to preach middle ground. I, I'm not here to appease somebody's ears. So you either love me or hate me. It's one or the other. If people are pursuing God and they're sincere and they're hungry and they're going after God, they get in denial, they get in whatever, then they start resenting me. I've, I've bumped into that. I've had people tell me they hate me. I don't know why I'm such a nice guy. <laughs> they have to be deceived. <laughs> yeah, I don't fit into their mindset. I don't fit into their will, their life. So, so then hate is murder. So just cut the person off. It doesn't work. Truth still speaks. Truth still alive. You kill Stephen, it's still the same. Truth still, you kill Jesus, truth still the same. You kill Stephen, truth still crying out. You murder hundreds and hundreds of Christians, truth still here. You can't kill it. Oh, like, oh. Man, that feels happy. Oh my goodness. 
So in Luke 10, he does something a little different here in Luke 10. After these things, verse one, the Lord appointed 70 others also. Wow. Now I like that. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty cool. Because we're like, well, yeah, but it's for, that was in the apostles' days, and that was for the disciples. Well, you can blow that out of the water. Some of these things we say in the church and grow up believing, it fascinates me. It, and I'm not being crude or rude when I say this. It makes me wonder if we even read our Bibles, because it's like... We, we've got to be reading our Bibles through a certain eye. I guess there's filters on us. So when you read your Bible, you read it to support a certain thing. And then you see it a certain way or something. I don't know how it happens. But I would tell you, if you get alone with Jesus and ask him to reveal truth to you and just show you truth, man, it, it comes. It's like, whoa. Because there's so many scriptures coming to my mind right now that reveal that this thing is for us just as much as the apostles. And you can't even get around it. It's so clear. You would have to so misinterpret. And, 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 and see, here's the thing. A lot of these things that people say that are so misinterpreted, they take one scripture that's complex and make it say something, but it's at the cost of three or four or five crystal clear scriptures. That's a dead giveaway. If you're interpreting a scripture at the cost of a whole bunch of other scripture to where you almost have to tear that out to make this work, you probably ought to reconsider what you're defining it to say. Because <laughs> in the long run, it should all complement one another. It's like one big puzzle coming together in one beautiful picture. Do you get it? And that's how the Bible should be interpreted through Holy Spirit. You can't, you can't interpret a scripture at the cost of other scripture. So here's 70 more. I mean... He adds 70. Who are these 70 people? <laughs> it doesn't really say. Who are they? How did he choose them? What gives them the right? How did they qualify? Because Jesus wanted to. <laughs> he picked them. <laughs> Why did he pick the, the 12? He knew, Just, he knew they'd come. Duh. He picked them. They were ready. They're in, they're in position. They went. They, it's good, Donna. But isn't this cool? He added 70 more. It just fascinates me because it's prophetic. It's a statement. He's pointing to something. He's saying this isn't a one-time deal, Matthew 10, and it's not just reserved for this little niche of people. I'm adding to this number. And he's really declaring that there's a time coming where believers are going to live this way, where I'm going to go to Jerusalem, give my life, raise from the dead, hand you the baton, you're going to be my church. It's really prophetic. It's really amazing. He had 70 others also and sent them, which means Jesus, just like knighting people, he, he rules his kingdom with the scepter of righteousness. You come and you kneel and you bow before him in humility and he comes and, and dubs you righteous and anoints you and boom, and you're knighted in the kingdom and now you're a soldier and yay. Come on, it's amazing. That means, that means he can qualify you. He can anoint you. He can give you his authority. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now go. What's he saying? It's yours. Because you're in me and I'm in you and you're my church. Why are we confused about that? Why do we argue over that? Why are we afraid to receive that? Why do we want to stay beat and defeated and frustrated and argue over something so clear? Listen, you can if you want. I'm going to stay full of joy and watch like I saw this weekend. I'm going to watch stuff I saw all weekend. You can stay argumentative all you want. I'm going to watch the gospel transform lives. I'm going to watch young men say, I didn't think this was real. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Fight with me all you want. I tell people, I haven't seen enough. I'm just getting rolling. But I've seen way too much to change my mind. Listen, all authority. Matthew 28. How much authority? Oh, is he name above every name? Will every knee, heaven, earth, under the earth bow? Will, won't it? Will the devil bow? 
Will he be wrapped in chains and thrown in fire forever? Can he do anything to stop it? Because he can't stop God. He doesn't have that kind of power. He can only deceive us and try to stop God's power. Get us to argue over things that are settled. Get us to build streams and camps and rivers that don't exist in the kingdom. You follow me? How much authority has been given unto me in heaven and on? Do you know in Matthew 28? You better look at it just so you know I'm telling you the truth. I can quote this stuff, but we're in a school. I guess we better go to the text. (laughs) Matthew 28, verse 18. This one puzzles me if we back up here. Look at verse 16. Then then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. Watch how the human mind can work. Here's 11 disciples... Okay, they went away into Galilee on a mountain which Jesus had appointed. So the, they said, the girls said, hey, you're supposed to go meet him on this mountain. Remember? So they go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. He's raised from the dead. He's standing there and they go, oh, and they're worshiping. And some are going, and they're, but in their minds, they're going, can this really be you? I mean, you died. How can it be you? You're, and they're rationalizing, and they're doubting. And he's standing right there, raised from the dead. Right in front of them, and some doubted. Do you see that? I learned from that stuff. I said, that is not the crowd that I'm running with. There's 11 in the room, and some are worshiping, and some are doubting. I will be a worshiper, period. <laughs> I will worship you, Jesus. <laughs> I do not honor my mind above my heart. (laughs) Hello? (laughs) Oh, that was a good word right there. (laughs) Yeah! (laughs) I will not honor my mind above my heart. Jennifer, I'm not going to do it. Don't you do it. Run with me. Be a worshiper. Amen. (laughs) Yeah. Are you getting it? You want to be a worshiper. You don't want to doubt. Well, I know, I know they're really healed. I mean, emotions are, you know, and sometimes it's like, it's just people just, they think they're They just want to be healed, so they gear their mind. It's just, people in the church do those studies and think that way. And come up with what seems to be a general truth about a thing that can be possible. But what about the supernatural? What about things made new? What about things just... So it's mind over matter? Well, we ought to be teaching everybody with cancer just mind over matter. We ought to be teaching every birth defect mind over... We ought to be teaching that principle then when have so much trouble. Come on, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Jesus is the healer and sometimes we need restoration. It's easy. It says in the Bible that we're supposed to live under love, uh, power, love, and sound mind. And, and sound mind, the word sound, actually means to have a trained, disciplined mind. It's militant. Right. It's like you need to take charge of your militant. mind. Do not think that flush. That's right. <laughs> Do not receive that flush. Colossians 3 says, set your mind on the things above and not the things of the earth. So what do you have to do? You have to literally set your mind. You position your mind. You live out of your heart, your mind comes into agreement. It's just you have to make your mind follow your heart. It's just a big deal. It is militant. It's, it's discipline. Watch this. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. That's, I have that circled and underlined. I'm like, huh? <laughs> and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, look what he said. He even spoke to the doubters. <laughs> <laughs> Patty, I hope that laugh wasn't. There's hope for me. <laughs> He's still speaking. <laughs> She's, oh, no, I'm just having fun. Oh, I got to sit down on that one. <laughs> Patty had too much relief come on her. <laughs> I'm having fun with you, girl. <laughs> Watch this. So he did. He, remember in Mark, he, he corrected them for their hardness of heart and unbelief. Because they didn't believe the ones that saw him after he raised. And in the same breath, he said, now go into all the world and make disciples. Reproduce yourself. 
He saw right past their weakness, imparted strength, and sent them out in the truth. They're sitting there in unbelief. He says, what are you guys doing? You ought to know better. Come on, these are, they were family. They saw me. You ought to just believe. Why are your hearts hard? Now listen, get over that and get out there. Bam. Set them right out. Some doubted. Some are worshiping. Some doubted. They all have the same commission. The doubt doesn't change the commission. The door's still open to go. The doubts probably just would have keep you from doing it. But Jesus didn't change his mind, did he? Jesus didn't say, look, you guys that are worshiping me, here's a special assignment. He's talking to everybody. Come on, you need to see that stuff. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, how much authority? All authority has been given to who? Well, it's to him, to me, he says, to me. In heaven and where? It's important, he says on earth, on purpose. Heaven and on earth. Go therefore. What's he doing when he says go therefore? He's sending us in that authority. Because he's sending us in his name. It's an ambassador. An ambassador goes and represents what it's an ambassador of and represents completely fully and walks in the authority of that representation. When he says all authority, this is on purpose. All authority is given to me, now go, because he's saying, you're one with me. I'm in you. You're in me. So he's actually handing you the authority. In Matthew 10, when he says, go preach saying the kingdom's here, he put the authority of the kingdom on them and and, and sent them, and that he hadn't even died and rose from the dead yet. He just gave it to them and sent them in his name. Now he's raised from the dead, and he comes and, and puts the kingdom inside of us and tells us to go and say, hey, the kingdom's here. The kingdom's in reach, it's near you. It's like two feet away. Right? Yeah. Go therefore and make disciples, not confessing Christians. Not praying a prayer just to go to heaven and get your name in a book someday. Make disciples. Disciples are disciplined learners. Disciple is wholehearted follower. John 8 defines a disciple. It says, if you continue in my word, you're my disciple indeed. Not if you continue in your human reasoning, your emotions, your rationale, and the way the world thinks. But if you continue in my word, you reveal you're my disciple. You're following me. You know the privilege of that? You will know the truth. It's John 8, 32. You will know the truth. And what? Truth. Truth. What? Truth. Truth. That's just you being illuminated, (gasps) seeing what you didn't see before, being held by truth. You're okay because of what you see. Before you weren't okay, nothing's in line, but all of a sudden nothing's changed, but you see different and you're okay and nothing's changed. Who's ever experienced that? That in the middle of chaos, God gave you a revelation that comforted your heart and held you stable and even the chaos didn't change yet. It's your perspective, it's truth, it girds you, it holds you. Does it make sense? Ah, Truth is your best friend, I promise. He's the spirit of, he's our best friend. Truth's my best friend. (laughs) He came and he said, I'm the truth. We beheld him in grace and truth. Man, the grace of truth. Think about that. That's another topic, but... Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Watch. Teaching them. Teaching who? Them. The, the disciples that are coming through the disciples. Teaching them. Who's he talking about? You and me. He's talking about people that believe. Teaching them to observe what? All things I've commanded you. So when he says, go in to the world and preach the kingdoms at hand, heal the sick, is that a command? 
Is that something he sent them to do? Did he command them to do that? So all things that he's commanding, they're commanding us to do the same? Isn't it amazing how somewhere along the line it got taught that that's not for us today, that that day passed away, that when we got the word that ended all. Isn't it amazing how opposite the things we grew up hearing and hearing preached is from what's really being said? Remember how last week I got on that when and if thing and how we've shifted the whens and ifs? The Bible says, if you sin, we think when we sin. <laughs> With fasting, it says when you fast, we think if I ever decide to fast. <laughs> it says when you fast and if you sin, we say if I fast and when I sin. <laughs> that is not an accident. That's not happenstance that that's happened. It's not happenstance that the Bible says, get your hopes up. It's the anchor of your soul. It goes through the veil into his presence. Faith is the substance of the things you hope for. In your whole life, you heard people compassionately say, well, now, honey, don't get your hope up. Your whole life. Well, it'd be great if that happened, but honey, it doesn't always work. Don't, I just don't want to see your heart broken, so don't get your hope up. And the Bible says, no, no, get your hope up. Your whole life, well, honey, just what you don't know won't hurt you. Look, what you don't know won't hurt you. You read that book, it says what you don't know will destroy your life. It's not an accident that you grew up hearing those things your whole life. Because they're contrary to truth. It's a strategy and it's from hell. <clears throat> Well, what you see is what you get, brother. Totally anti-gospel. Well, you made your bed, sleep in it. Yeah. No, you know what I say? No, he made my bed and it has nice clean sheets. I'm crawling in that one. Yeah. <laughs> You're getting it, girl. <laughs> That's her righteous dance. <laughs> woo, woo. <laughs> See, she's gone now. <laughs> Teaching who? Teaching who? Them. Us. To observe what? Some things or all things? Come on, be real with me. Some things or all things? See, this has to be important to us. We have to catch this. That I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you. Always. Now watch. When you go, is he with you? You know why he's with you? Because you went. Because if he didn't go with you and you went, why would you go? You don't go without him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. <laughs> Do you understand? Go to, go to Mark. My Bible is falling apart. It's so well used. It's <laughs> <laughs> Were you hearing Holy Spirit or something there? <laughs> she said it's time. I'm going to have to go pray about that one. <laughs> go to Mark 3 real quick with me, real quick. Mark 3, 13. And I know we probably covered this in the school, but because in the first week we talked about intimacy, but it's just good to rehash some things and keep some things. Uh, somebody just said to me, I was down in Virginia, they said, you know, you say so many of the same things over and over and over, and I love it. That's what they said to me. You have to understand how gospel that is, how gospel it is to say the same thing over and over again. Paul writes, he says, it's not tedious for me to write the same thing over and over again because for you it's a safeguard. It's in Philippians. Hebrews 2 says, take earnest heed of the things you've heard, lest you slip away. 2 Peter 1 says, Peter says, I write these things even though you know them and are established in them. But I believe it's good for me to stir you by reminding you. 
There's so many places. Yeah. <laughs> so it's scriptural for me to say the same thing. Or it's not because I don't have anything else to preach. It's because some things are so important they need to be understood. Because they're foundational. And if the root's good, the tree's good. And if the tree's good, the fruit's good. So let's get rooted and grounded in love and spring up as trees of righteousness, the planning of the Lord, that He might be glorified. Yeah. Okay. And He went up on the mountain. Now here's, here's, these, here's these guys that He's talking to in Matthew 28. It's the same guys. That's why I turned you here. In Matthew 28, He's saying, He's sending them, right? He's telling them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. See, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I understand that the whole world's in the sway of the wicked one. That means they're just going with the tide of selfish desire and lust. Going with the tide of temptation and flesh. He's the God of this world. In other words, people have come under under His dominion, so to speak, by agreeing with Him and yielding with His pleasure and His stuff. You see what I mean? But who knows that God is still God? He says in Luke, he says in Luke, ah, we got to do this. It's a school. I can't just preach this stuff out. We got to look at this stuff. Look at Luke 4, verse 5. This is the devil tempting Jesus. The devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Luke 4, chapter 5. I hear all them pages. I better wait. Verse 5, Luke 4. You ready? Okay. The devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, Watch all this authority I will give you and their glory for this, this what? This authority, this glory, this Isn't that amazing? When God made man in the garden, He gave him the the earth. He said, subdue the works of my hands. Tend the earth, govern it, keep it. Have dominion over every creeping thing. And even the creep, right? The creep. So He has authority. He has dominion over the earth. Here's Satan telling Jesus all this authority. He's not just deceiving him here. He's trying to deceive him, but he's not just lying. He's actually making a point that, look, this was handed to me. This was delivered to me. It was set on my doorstep, and I can give it to anybody I want. Watch. He says, all this authority I will give you and their glory. Isn't it amazing that Jesus is here to gain back all the authority in heaven and earth and the devil's cutting in front trying to counterfeit that giving and the giving of that authority. A false sense of authority. He's he's trying to deceive him and counterfeit and shortcut and make it all about Jesus having the authority instead of Jesus representing the Father and loving the world. It's a power trip. It's just twisted. But there's a point here we've got to see. I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whoever I wish. Oh, Jesus, you're amazing. He says, therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Who knows that that's a setup, and that's deception, and that's twisted. Watch this. Jesus answered and said to him, get Behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. So from that moment on, what did Jesus do in His life? When you see me, you see the Father. I know where I come from. I know where I'm going. The Father's always with me, because I always do what He says to do. I don't do anything but the will of Him who sent me. The whole way through. So he's worshiping the Lord with his life. He's serving Him the whole time. And now, he dies as a man. Sinless, blameless, as a lamb, as a man, as a lamb slain. (sighs) 
He raises from the dead for our justification. And in Matthew 28, he rises up and says, All authority has been given to me. What happened? He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He took the authority that Adam passed on through deception and gave to the devil. He took it from him by being the perfect sacrifice, sinless and and sin-free. And now all that authority comes to Jesus. Now what's Jesus do? He gives it back to man just like God did to Adam in the first place. It's all there. God breathed into Adam. Adam became alive. Jesus raised from the dead and breathed into his guys. Life came into their spirit. Come on, it's all there. Mark 3, I turned you there, didn't I? We probably ought to read it. I'm so happy. Uh, Forgive me. I'm just so happy. I am. I am pumped. Do you know this gospel doesn't get old to me? It's so fresh. It says every day there's mercy, fresh mercy and fresh grace every day. Yeah. (laughs) Mark 3. We're going to try to do this. He went up on the mountain and called to him those who he himself wanted. Wow. He appointed 70 more. And now he called all of our hearts. Those who he predestined, he called. Those who he called, he justified. This is Romans 8, I'm quoting. Those who he justified, he glorified. He glorified? Yeah. By filling us with the same spirit that raised him from the dead. So, if any man's come to him, if any man's desired him, it's because he's been wooed and called by him. So are we all called? Does he want us all? Are we his choice? Are we his desire? Hello? So are you the called of the Lord? Yeah. So he called to him those who he himself wanted. Well, he's wooing all men, isn't he? At this point, it was reserved to who? Those 11, because he was imparting to them, he had intimacy with them, he was preaching the gospel to all men, but to these men he imparted something. Why? Because he's about to commission them after he raises from the dead, and he's going to send them out as the uh, nucleus, if you will, of the church that is. It's, you get this? They're going to carry that torch. They're going to be fruitful and... They're going to tend and keep the... The earth, the garden, they're going to subdue the earth, not be subdued by it. And they're going to be fruitful and sound familiar? Oh, my goodness. He went up on the mountain. He called to them who he himself wanted. And, oh, look at this good news. And they came to him. Thank God. Don't run from him. Come to him. Don't hide. Don't get in denial. Don't do injustice to your own heart and soul. Yield to him. Amen? Then he appointed twelve Look what he appointed them to. What did he appoint them to? To be with him. What's first? (laughs) How intimate and precious is that? He didn't appoint them to go do miracles. He appointed them to be with him. Do you hear the intimacy of that? Do you hear relationship? Do you hear love? (laughs) Oh... (laughs) They appointed him that they might be what? With him. him. And look, look at the order. Because see, if this isn't the order, you'll go without him. You go because you're with him. You don't go because that's what qualifies you to say you're with him because you went. You go because you're with him. Relationship is huge. You don't live without the grace of God. You don't go. Watch. It says, how can they hear? How can they believe if they haven't heard? How can they hear if they have no one to preach to them? And how can they preach if they haven't been sent? Guess what sends you? Being with Him. Because when you're being with Him, you become one with His heart and you have to go. Do you see the concept? 
When you're with him, you become one with him. His heart is yours. And the go in his heart is the go in your heart. That's why every Christian, whether they're taught this or not, is conscious at times of people and feeling like they ought to go step in and maybe go pray or encourage or, and they're not sure how to get, and they kind of pull back, but they're conscious, they're aware, they know they could. Because oh, uh, it's God's heart inside of them. I love them. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. Who's ever been in that situation? <laughs> Who's ever been in the one where you were so aware that it was available and you so wanted to, but you just weren't? I think we've all been. And you just kind of find reasons why maybe you shouldn't. But you sure can't deny that the opportunity's there and you, and you feel pulled and yet you pull back and you feel pulled and you pull back. Who's ever been through that? Why? It's because it's God's spirit in you. It's his heart. You're one with him. And God's attention is there. God's heart is saying this. You wouldn't even think that way apart from him. You'd be just busy about yourself. Really? Most of the time. That's how it would be. He appointed them that they might be what? With him. Oh, and from that place, right? That he might send them out to preach. So being with him is what sends you out. Wow. That he, they might be with him that he might send them out. Hear purpose? Hear order? Oh. Man, that way you're going by the Spirit, you're going in grace. It's not, well, if you're a Christian, you better go out. You ought to be loving on people. If you're a Christian, you need to do that. No, we shouldn't even have to preach that. We should preach, be with him and then he cultivates love in our heart. And all of a sudden when we hear go, we go, yeah, why not? And even if we're still getting over our self in areas and building confidence and still have to stir ourselves to cross certain lines, we, we, we so understand it's God. You follow me? I'm laying a real simple, big time foundation, but simple to understand before we get into the rest of this week because we're going to talk about loving people all week and just some, some good stuff. It'll be good that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach. So it must be important to be with him, and it must be just as important to be sent out to preach, because how can they hear if they have no one to preach? How do they know love if they haven't met you? Why do we just think God has to show up in everybody's dreams? <laughs> <laughs> we're so spiritual brother we just believe God will invade their dreams well wonder if he wants to say hi through you <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> you guys all right <laughs> preaching good Becky ain't I <laughs> told you I had a good weekend <laughs> I am so pumped oh my goodness that he might send them out to preach. Uh-oh, uh-oh. There has to be authority involved in this. Oh my gosh. Does your Bible say power or authority? Because if it says power, the word is actually authority. Power and authority are the same. If it's, it's the same Greek word, but it's a different word than power like dunamis. You follow me? Authority. The best word here is authority. To have authority. Might be better to understand authority than power to heal sickness. All week long, all weekend I was saying, oh my goodness, because I get, I, I can perceive, I perceive certain things when, when I'm ministering in certain ways and God just lets it's been that way since I've been saved practically, but... I, I was so aware of the authority of the name of Jesus so many times this weekend and, and I found myself saying, oh my goodness, his authority. Authority's in the room. Do you perceive the authority of our king? It's in us, it's with us, guys. He's in agreement. He's saying yes. And there's like 
the atmosphere was full of impregnated with authority. And you, you speak and things happen. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. This is really cool. We're trying to have power. We have to understand that all authority is Jesus. And he said go because we're in him. We're one with him. We're the body of Christ. The embodiment of his anointing. So he wanted them with him that he might send them out to have, send them out to preach and have what? So not just to preach, but to have authority to heal sicknesses. I've heard this countless times. Well, brother, it's not always about just healing the sick. It's not just about the sick. People need saved. It's not just about healing the sick. It seems important to him. He's the one that talks about it all the time. He's the one. It's his fault. I find it everywhere I'm reading. It's, don't take it up with me. I'm not chasing signs and wonders. They follow the believer. They're not lost. They're hovering over belief, waiting for it to happen. Belief. Signs and wonders are spiritually following every one of us, waiting for belief. They're not lost. Belief gets lost. Signs and wonders know right where they are. <laughs> they're, they're waiting to happen. <laughs> Come on, I'm just trying to be understandable and simple. I'm not trying to be silly. I'm trying to make this as plain. It's so plain. It's so simple. Watch. To have authority to heal sickness. So God must want to heal the sick if he's going to give us authority to do it. Do you see why it's important to have healthy identity? Do you see why it's important to not be self-conscious? See why it's important to not move in fear and get into works and think it has to do with you? You're God's elect. You're God's choice. You're, you're the roster of heaven. You're the team of God. You're the best he's got. You're the, you're the ones he could find, and it's so good enough. He's happy about that. And we're going, who, hey, us? Man, what a ragtag team we are, boy. <laughs> No different than the apostles. Good point. Why is it any different than the men he chose in the first place? Right. Us sitting here. Why is it any different? Yeah. Uh-oh. Sorry, I had no idea. Thank you. We're actually after 12. So we are done. There is always tomorrow. That they have authority to what? Heal sickness and cast out what? That's amazing. Watch this. Watch this. Jesus didn't even die, shed his blood, or raise from the dead. And he's still Lord, so he could still delegate authority to men to have power over the thing that had them in a vice. That means demons don't stand a chance in the presence of God. Don't even stand a chance. And yet we're afraid of stuff because we don't understand who he is and who we are. I'm not talking presumptuous and arrogant right now. I'm talking plain truth. So the, the heal the sick. So is it important to God that people are healed? Because he's given you authority to do that. It doesn't even, I know this will make some people a little frustrated at times, but it doesn't even say to get them into heaven or get them what we call born again. That's God's heart for every man, I understand. But he wants them to preach and have authority to heal sickness. That's his intention. He says, go into the city and preach the kingdoms here and heal the sick. We've turned it into getting people to quote our prayer and repeat this prayer we came up with about 100 years ago called the sinner's prayer. We thought we'd help God out and we have a better idea. Let's just get everybody to quote this prayer. Jesus said, no, would you go with authority and heal the sick and cast out devils and move darkness off of people so they can see the light? Yeah, I'm done. We got to quit. Stand to your feet, would you, please? And let's honor him, honor Jesus. Father, we just honor you. Would you do this with me? Yeah, that's right. Lift your hands to, to him and just honor him. It's just a sign of yielding, honor. I yield, adapt myself to you. I honor you. I worship you. I lift hands to you. I'm like the little child saying, thank you, Daddy, for picking me up.
pulling me up out of life, delivering me, making me whole, letting my heart come alive, be filled with hope and confidence in you. Thank you, it's not a whim, it's not presumptuous, it's not a tangent, it's not concocted, it's right there in your word. So Father, thank you for letting me run right into you. And just thank you for calling me and choosing me and building me up for your glory and your name's sake. I know I'm loved. I know your pleasure is to give me all that you are. I receive it and I thank you. I thank you that you've created me in your image. Thank you for seeing fit to see my day. I don't dread life. I value life. And I face every opportunity to manifest your love. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Bless you guys. I love you guys.